Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another working session for our physics project. So I thought today uh, it's just one day less than a year since we launched our project. And I thought Jonathan and I might chat a bit about some future directions. And uh, tomorrow we're going to be doing a uh, big survey of where we think we are right now. Um, but I thought maybe we could start talking about a few things that are sort of coming attractions and so on. And actually, just yesterday, Jonathan was getting me up to speed on his latest thinking about category theory and its relationships to our project and so on. And uh, uh, I realized that there are a few things that I don't quite understand. So maybe we could start off by trying to explore some of those things. And um, I think the, the, the thing that I'd sort of understood from um, uh, yesterday was sort of the, these two slightly different ways of applying category theory thinking in connection with our project. Um, one, the way that it's working in kind of the quantum mechanics and categorical quantum mechanics story, and the other, the way that it's working in kind of the limiting to the Rulial multi-way system story thing, uh, which was the idea of a, a proof as generated by our theorem proving system that is, so just, just to review for my benefit, um, we can think of, when we do use find equational proof, we can think of it as finding a path, almost just a path in a multi-way system. Is that true? But for the critical pair lemmas, which work a little differently, is that right? Right, right, exactly. So let's, let's go through just for my and other people's understanding. I mean, so, so in an equational proof, part of the story is we're just making substitutions, which are things that could be just rule applications uh, of picking which, which path you go on, which branch you go on in, in the multi-way graph, right? Right, right, exactly. Okay, so now what's the minimal understanding of a critical pair lemma in that setting? Um, okay, so the minimal, well, I don't, I don't quite know what you mean by minimal understanding. I mean, the, the, the reason they are required is so long as you have a confluent term rewriting system, then you can represent the whole proof just with substitution lemmas, right? So, so because if it's confluent and it's strongly normalizing, then I can just go through, you know, left, I'm, I'm trying to prove some equation. I can just go through from left to right on both sides of the equation, apply any rules that I can apply. And then if, if it's strongly normalizing, they will both terminate at, at some normal form. And if the system is confluent, those normal forms have to be the same if and only if the original expressions were the same. So- But hold on a second, because I mean, one of the issues here is equations versus expressions, which right. I think, I mean, I was just looking yesterday at, um, uh, again, at the homotopy type theory book, which I should be able to completely understand. And it was talking about some of these kinds of things and I got confused again. Um, but, but so in a multi-way graph, the standard thing would be expression is equivalent to expression by virtue of a path going from one expression to the other, which is a different way of setting things up than the equation way of setting things up, right? Uh, well, yes, but I, I disagree that that's the standard multi-way picture. Okay. Um, well, so your standard multi-way picture is more like a predicate logic multi-way picture where every node represents an assertion. Right, 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 exactly. exactly. And, and so in this particular case, they happen to be equational logic assertions. Um, but yeah, as, as they as could be say, arbitrary predicates. Right, exactly. Okay, so and, and so what you're saying is the one approach to proving an equational logic, you know, equality would be in the strongly normalizing confluence system is just you tear the thing apart you make both sides go to their normal forms and then you're done, basically. Exactly, right. Okay, but so now assume we don't tear it apart. Assume that we actually have a, a, an axiom that says, you know, well, what, what should it say? It should say x equals x gives true. Right, right. And then, so then what we're searching for is a way to go from our, from our predicate to the, to the special node that represents true. Is that correct? Right, exactly. So, so obviously, as you, as you say, for equational logic, the way you define 
the you know the expression true is as you know any any expression of the form x equals x. Although we could have an axiom in our underlying system that says x equals x goes to the the you know the special thing which generates balloons or something that is the true node. Is that correct? Right, right. Which I mean, implicitly is kind of what fine equational proof is doing because it's using the fact that anything of the form x equals x will evaluate a true just you know as possible. Exactly. Language, yeah. Right. But I mean, what it's doing, so, so that allows it to have balloons at many places in the multiway system. But in principle, we could insist that it goes to a particular node in the multiway system to represent its balloon moment, so to speak. Right, right. Okay, but so now, now the critical pair lemmas. So, right, so, so without critical pair lemmas, and therefore without a confluent substitution system, there's no guarantee that if the original, the, that you could have the situation where the two sides of the equation terminate at different normal forms, even if they're actually the same, even, you know, even if the original uh, predicate was, was actually true. Okay, and, th and so that can happen, for example, with, um, with that can happen because both things are flapping around and, and going through many different forms. There exists a, a place where those two forms can be equivalent, but that is not found as a normal form. That is somewhere in the, there exists somewhere in the space of possible equivalent forms for those things. There's just some path in which those two things will, will meet, but it is not the path that you get to by virtue of standard evolution. Right, right. Or it's not, it, you don't even have to define a notion of standard evolution. I mean, for, again, for fine equational proof, standard evolution is just, is trivial kind of left to right application, but it could be any notion. The, 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 the point is that, you know, like with uh, like with combinators, when you don't define an evaluation strategy or something, uh, yeah, with, unless you have confluence uh, and strong norm normalization, you kind of you're a bit stuck if you just want to represent the proof as a pure substitution lemma proof without you know essentially searching every possible path. Um, but just so, the, so we're clear, just so we're clear, in yeah. in principle, the critical pair lemmas are not. I mean, in principle, there exists a way with pure substitutions to, to reach the, it is the case, right? I mean, there exists a way to reach the true node, so to speak, with pure substitutions. Is that a, is that a correct statement? Sure, sure. But, but to do so would effectively require enumerating every possible multi-way path in general. Right. But I mean, th this is saying because, because the point is, you, you can you can evolve the thing until until you reach some you know until both sides reach a normal form. You find that inequivalent, but that doesn't prove that the original theorem was false. That just shows that it was you you didn't find a proof on that particular path. No, I understand. So you, in general, you'd have to do all possible evaluation strategies, which would be you know prohibitively expensive. Right, but but hold on a second. The fact that you're saying two sides, left and right, is not necessarily the case because it could just be any predicate. It doesn't need to be the equality predicate. And then sure. what you're doing is you are you know. Your, your rule application can be pick wherever you want. And the question is, does there exist a sequence of rule applications that will be a path from this predicate down to the true node? Right, exactly. So, so if you wanted to think about it from a general predicate logic, what, what that's saying is without confluence, you could terminate as a normal form that isn't true, even for a theorem that is true, just because you picked the wrong evaluation strategy. Exactly, yes, right, exactly. But, but that, is, that is by virtue of pure multi-way evolution. But if you were prepared to do a search of all, possible, you know, of all possible paths, there is a path, there exists a path from the predicate. There's nothing, okay, so just, I'm just trying to understand the stack of what's, what's involved here. So there always exists, if the predicate is going to be equivalent to true, there exists a path applying multi-way rules so that that predicate ends up with true. And if, if, the, if their equational logic rules, there happen to be two-way, there happen to be the two-way versions of those transformations, right? Right, right. Okay, so now we've got something which is sort of the default thing. Now the question is, okay, so how does a critical pair lemma speed that up? Right, so, so what the critical pair lemma lets you do, I mean, okay, if you want to think about it at the pure multi-way level, which I'm not sure is necessarily the best way, but... Um, then all that's doing is it's pre it's preventing you from having to search two paths. You know, it, it, you can now search only one path where you would have searched two, because in effect, what it's doing is it's defining an equivalence relation between a pair of paths. Actually, it's not just a pair; 
it's it's a, it, it may be many more than a pair because it's 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 defining an equivalence relation between two elements of a branch, and you know each each of those branches may go off and branch more, and so in effect you're defining an equivalence relation between a whole collection of paths. But intuitively, that's that's what it's doing. It's preventing you from having to search all of them because you can just define them as all being equivalent. But so in a multiway in the multiway case, let's just let's just go through this. Um, I mean, the you're saying. The critical pair lemma says there is, you know, what we might call the multi-way function, so to speak. The multi-way function takes a single, a single expression and turns it into multiple outputs. Right? Yep. I was, I mean, part of the reason I'm I'm pointing this out is that I was I, I'm one of my little homework problems is to try and find the right generalization in our language for multi-way systems. So, in other words, right now we have a function which takes an input and gives an output, right? And, but in a multi-way system, we want a function that takes one input and generates multiple outputs, but doesn't just generate an out outputs, it also has dependency information, i.e. causal edge information. Right, right. Which is something that an ordinary function doesn't need to, so, uh, uh, I mean, you know, what, what we've already done in the multi-way system code, in your code, is, you know, we take the input, we break it up. We then say which part of the input is going to be transformed. We then, and then we put it back together again at the end. Right, right. And, and the question is, what is the generalization? What, what is the general way to think about that? And right. is there some kind of multifunction function that can represent that? And then the exercise is, if we have that, what's the analog? I mean, nest list, for example, which for a single function, you know, we understand what it does. What are the analogous functions for the for the multifunction case? Mm -hmm. so yeah, that was my that was my little exercise in in trying to understand. But but let's just understand the critical pair lemma in this setting. So you're saying in this multifunction, it has you know single input x goes in and y one, y two, y three come out, mm -hmm. and the critical pair lemma is going to say you know y one equals y three or something. Right. Correct. Right. And, and which, which, yeah. which is why, by the way, that this this is this whole setup is dependent on equational logic rather than more general predicate logics, because the fact that you can take a critical pair, you know, x comma y, and add a lemma that merges those paths is as a co is a consequence of the transitivity of equality. Right, right. Because Let's just walk through that for a second. I mean, so so that's assuming, so x goes to y one and y two, and we can say that y one is equal to y two. Does that require, I mean, it requires that those are two-way edges. Otherwise, none, none of this would work. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. It requires that it's equational because in effect, all the, the reason, you know, the, the reason the critical pair lemma thing works is because if X goes to Y1, X goes to Y2, then uh, X equals Y1, X equals Y2, and therefore by transitivity, Y1 equals Y2. And so you can add that as a lemma. Whereas if they were one-way implication arrows, as they would be for general predicate logic, then that isn't, you know, uh, X implies Y1, X implies Y2 tells you nothing about the mutual interdependency of Y1 and Y2. Um, so right. there isn't a straightforward generalization of the critical pair lemma case to the unidirectional edge, which is why, for instance, in fine equational proof, when we do predicate logic theorem proving, we reduce the whole thing to equational logic first, because it's just much easier to, to reason about that. Right. But okay, but so does it require, I mean, from a sort of graph theoretic point of view, is it sufficient just to say that they're two way edges? Or is there some other condition that's needed? I think it's sufficient because two way yeah. edges, you can always go from the y1 up through the x to the y2. Right, right. No, no it's, it's fine. Yeah. So, so if you know, if you want to talk about it category theoretically, this is a theorem proving technique that works only in groupoids and topoid, but not in more general categories. Because those are things where the morphisms go both ways. Right, right, or can be made to go both ways, yeah. Right, okay, so, so then, all right, so one of the things that you're now saying, which is very interesting, is we take a proof, and a proof is, well, a proof in, in this setup that you've defined, a proof in some sense is you go from the predicate you're trying to prove down to the true thing, right? right. But in doing that, you are also using certain critical pair lemmas rather than just using, I mean, you could be just using substitutions. You can always do it with just substitutions, but it is going to be much more efficient to also use critical pair lemmas. Sure. 
right? So, and so each critical pair lemma can be thought of as it does in equational proof, find equational proof, as a little stub that's hanging off that says, this has another branch that I'm not going to show. But what, what, what exactly is happening in the, in, in the representation of the proof, the critical pair lemma, what does the critical pair lemma represent in the representation of the proof? Well, you have a little, little red triangle. It's representing that there's another arm of the, of the branch that would be the arm you naturally took, but you are swapping it to go in, in the path that you're taking, you're taking the other arm effectively, the other branch. Is that right? But it's not even that you're taking the other branch, it's that you're declaring the two branches to be, to be the same. You're saying, I don't need to navigate the other branch because everything I would find is, is equivalent to the stuff I'm gonna find on this branch. No, I understand, but in, in trying to make the transmission from the initial predicate to the final true thing, Mm -hmm. What is the, um, what, what is the, isn't it the case that what you get for a critical pair is you're saying you're actually going to pick the other branch of that critical pair because you know it exists. Is that not correct? Um, I, I, maybe you can think of it that way. I, I don't know. I, I prefer to think of it as just you're saying, okay, there, th this thing branches because there's an overlap in the uh, the um, you know the, the, this the input for this particular rule can overlap in you know in, in, to, to to yield two different outputs. Uh, so to prevent us from having to navigate two branches, I'm just going to navigate. I'm going to I'm going to define an equivalence relation that means those two branches are the same. So I, I'm not. I don't even have to pick which of the two branches to navigate because there's now only one branch up to that equivalence relation. Yes. Well, you're saying, but I mean, in terms of the final proof as presented, mm -hmm. right? You still need to, it is not the case that, that there would be a final proof which involves only substitutions, but that is not the proof that you present, right? Mm -hmm. The proof yeah. that you present has critical pair lemmas in it. Mm -hmm. And you could by, I don't know, what is it? The, the whole Genson-ish technique or something, you could unravel the critical pair lemmas. Is that a true statement? Yes, in fact, one of the 16 diagrammatic rewriting rules that I mentioned the other day does that. It you know, takes a critical pair lemma and, and splits it up into substitution lemmas. That's, that gets a bit complicated because that rule is actually non-local. Because So the reason why it's not as simple as just you're picking a path is because once you've defined that equivalence relation, then you're free to essentially introduce substitution lemmas that could have occurred on either of the two paths. Right, and you can basically yes. jump between them instantaneously, which you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, and so, when you unroll a critical pair lemma into substitution lemmas, actually, that has that has causal influence all the way down the future light cone. If you know what I mean, if you see what I mean, it's it, it's mm -hmm. that, that that will affect all future substitution lemmas. Um, so it's actually this, that rule actually is a non-local. It's one of the few rules in this calculus that's that's uh, completely non-local. So in our physics case. What is the analog of a Genson cut elimination story? Well, it's the. Do you mean the actual Genson cut elimination lemma, or this this kind of thing that's in it? I don't know what, what's the difference. I don't know. I don't know enough what the cut elimination. So the, the the cut elimination lemma is well. This applies only to the sequent calculus, and it is about. Uh, it's not. It's not about critical pair lemmas at all. It's really only about substitution lemmas, and it's the statement that actually you don't need substitution lemmas. You could. You could just have, uh, you know, because substi a substitution lemma is something that you can later use as a derived influence. All right. Okay. Right. So it's the reuse. It's the just the reuse of lemmas, and that, that's just that's just exponentially increasing the amount, the length of the proof. Okay. Exactly. Right. So so, so you correctly said that there is a, an extension of that idea of a cut elimination type idea to the critical pair lemma case. Uh, right. to best of my knowledge that isn't named, or at least it's not named after anyone famous. Um, or but yeah, famous. Okay, but 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 let's just understand what that is. I mean, roughly, what that's going to say is to get rid of that. What it means is that every place where you might be using one branch, you can add the possibility of having this thing that goes from you know from y one to x to y two. You can right. you can just add that in. So so what is that? In, in the physics case, what, what is the analog of that? Well, okay, I mean, uh, obviously, 
uh, okay, what I'm about to say is is dependent on you using a particular interpretation. If you, you know, if you if you interpret quantum measurement, if you interpret you know the action of a, of a Hermitian operator as essentially a critical, you know, as as like something analogous to a critical pair lemma, right? Because what what you're what you're saying there is I've got all these different branches. I'm now going to define an equivalence relation between them so that I just have one effectively classical eigenstate up to that equivalence relation, which is exactly what a what you know what a Hermitian operator does for, for you know for, for a quantum superposition. So then uh, what the what your cut elimination lemma thing would be saying is okay, so okay, once I've done that, once I've you know collapsed the wave function, once I've got a single pure eigenstate that evolves as a classical system, you know, it's its future evolu evolution is purely classical. Um, on the other hand, I could have just continued evolving the superposition, and that classical evolution would have been a particular trajectory of a classical eigenstate. Yeah, right. um, but but it, it would have required exponential. So, so I think what you're basically saying is that elimination procedure is the simulation on a classical computer of what is otherwise a quantum process. That's actually not a bad way to think about it, yes. So, I mean, it's basically, that is the sequentialization. That is the classical sequentialization of what would otherwise be a parallelly done thing. Right, right. So, I see. So, the, the existence of critical pair, well, the existence of critical pairs is a sign of quantum mechanics, basically, because that's what is causing one to have these parallel threads happening. And the existence of critical pair lemmas is the statement following your interpretation of quantum mechanics, I mean, of basically saying what, you know, the existence of critical pair lemmas is the classicalization, is the possibility of classicalizing by making equivalent these different paths. Right, right, exactly. Um, okay, interesting. So now, all right, so now the question would be, what, so, okay, so let's come to, to your new, idea of taking a path and uh, and being able to essentially go making path to path transformations right so a path in well we a proof okay so first question is you've got a procedure for for transforming one path to another what what is the interpretation of that procedure and what's the physics interpretation of that procedure uh that's a good question i mean in a sense we don't normally think about you know okay at least in the quantum mechanical picture we normally think about collections of paths we don't usually think about individual paths and how right. they you know, how they get perturbed that's something much more that's it's that seems much closer to something you might do in in the context of gr is talk about right. theory on geodesics um, so I, I don't have a I don't have a particularly good answer to that question. Well, let's, but let's think about but so so in the case of general relativity, the transformation from one JD stick to another, what how do we think about that? Because that's effectively what you're defining. I mean, in the, in the you know the homotopy story, like if there's a black hole in the middle between your two JD six, then you have trouble in in making a transformation from one JD stick to another. What how do we think about that? What's the general relativity way to think about that? Well, so normally, as any um, you know, sort of any diffeomorphism transformation that preserves the metric, you can think of as being a you know a mapping between GD six, right? Because you know if if you imagined only taking the light like GD six, then any any mapping from one GD six to another is some kind of rotation. Any mapping from one GD six to another that doesn't uh, you know um, modify volume elements is going to be some form of rotation of a light cone. Yes. Uh, so, so, so the you know the, the more general way to think about that is you would say, okay, I'm just applying some diffeomorphism, maybe a local diffeomorphism transformation to space time, uh, but but you know crucially one that doesn't change, uh, you know, the, the you know doesn't modify the metric. It doesn't it doesn't increase or decrease volumes and, and things like that. But is there a real physical interpretation of that? I mean, it, you're saying there are two paths, and it sort of doesn't matter which path you take. But I don't know what I don't quite know what the physical interpretation of that is. I mean, it is it is in a sense the the existence of a quote topological obstruction like thing is a story of whether you can do that, of whether you can have that continuous transformation from one geodesic to another, isn't it? 
Right, right, sure. That's certainly a definition of a kind of topological obstruction, yeah. Right, but so, so in, in a sense, if there's a particle in the, in the picture, perhaps, you wouldn't be able to do that. But I mean, in general, the thing I'm trying to understand and, and the whole homotopy type world and so on and so on and so on, I mean, it's contrast. I mean, what I'm understanding is everything is about paths in, in that setup. I mean, in other words, you, you're not thinking so much about points in space, you're thinking about paths defining things. Is that a fair? Right, right. Um, yes, because in general, you, you, in general, you, the only reason you care about homotopy type theory is, is because of what it says at a proof theoretic level, and everything that you know, it, at a, and at a proof theoretic level, everything is a path, at least in the low, you know, in the lower level space. Right. But okay. But 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 okay. So again, let's just go through that for a second. I'm 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 um, because I mean, what you're defining in this proof transformation idea is. What will be the application of your proof transformation idea to general relativity? Is there such an application? Well, it would be it, it would be a way of um, well. Okay, so first thing to say is that, in a sense, if you're thinking about now interpreting a causal graph as a proof graph, then this problem of um, the, pro the, the, pro the these issues about critical pair lemmas somehow become less significant. Because you're you're not you're not usually worrying about sort of traversing particular causal paths in GR. Usually, let me think about that for a second. What, what, one thing that's true: the critical pair lemma would be to say that two sides of a light cone are somehow equivalent. Is that correct? Right, right. It would be yeah, so. It would be modding out. It, you, yeah, you'd be modding out by again some kind of diffeomorphism transformation. Right. I mean, and, and but, but so to say that, to say the two sides of the light cone are equivalent is somehow to say, all that matters is whether you can get there at all. In other words, you're, 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 you know, you're equivalencing down everything that's inside the light cone. Mm -hmm. So you're asking, is there a way to get there? Perhaps even not a single geodesic or something. But I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what, whether there's a... Um... Right, and, and which is exactly what one does in the context of singularity theory, for instance, right? Because there, yeah. I mean, the, the definition of a space-time, uh, of a space-like singularity, sorry, is, is one where that singularity is in the future independent of which geodesic is chosen. Yes. So, but wait, hold on a second. So you're saying in the analysis of kind of the global structure of space-time, you're interested in so so you're saying to analyze the global structure of space time you can compress every light cone you can just say all i care about is whether you can get there you don't right. care about the details of the of the geometry of the light cone right exactly so 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 normally in gr you would talk you know this is why these concepts like future null infinity past null infinity etc all kind of uh, were developed because they they're ways of say of making global statements about uh, you know wh which which parts of space time are and are not reachable by any path, uh, rather than making specific, you know, reasoning, rather than doing specific reasoning about particular paths. Well, so so maybe what you're talking about here, in this, you know, all proofs are are you know proofs that are homotopically equivalent, is a statement of you know the map of what is homotopically inequivalent becomes some kind of causal map of space time. Right. Yes. I mean, in a sense, yeah. You you can. One could think about uh, homotopically inequivalent proofs as being like, you know, regions of causally disconnected regions of space time or something. Yeah, you know, in effect, what, what you're doing when you do this kind, you know, this form of diagrammatic homotopy type theory is, is mapping out the event horizon and singularity structure of some, you know, generalized notion of space time. Right. But so, okay, so let's, let's, let's think about that for a second. I mean, so, so what you're saying is that. You know, our interpretation in space-time is, you know, can you get from one path to another? Um, if you can't, it means there's some kind of singularity, some kind of causal singularity, like an event horizon. Um, and let's see. So, so what's the okay? So let's now take the quantum mechanical case. What's the analog of that homotopic inequivalence in the quantum mechanics case? Yeah, interesting. I mean, th th that's 
because I wonder the, if it's some kind of berry phase story or something. What, what, uh, okay, what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, because that's a case where um, maybe they have a different name now. The, um, you know, the things like this Bomaharanov effect. And so no, 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 on. yeah, sure. The, the geometric phase. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's been renamed in the past however many years. Right. Um, the, you, never, you never can count on these things staying the same. Okay. Geometric phase. Yes. Is so, that... so, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is what you're asking for is when are two quantum paths somehow homotopically an equivalent, right? So you've got this bundle of paths in the multi-way graph, which is a bundle of possible quantum trajectories in some sense. And the question is, as you're pointing out, usually in quantum mechanics, the preparation of states is such that you end up with a bundle of paths. Whereas in general relativity, you're more used to thinking about a single path. Right, a spacecraft goes in a single path. It's not a giant fleet of spacecraft. Right, and in the case of if it was a giant fleet of spacecraft, they would essentially map out where are the black holes because that's where the, the you know some parts of the fleet of spacecraft go missing type thing. And in the quantum mechanics case, one's more used to you know starting with a bundle of of paths. So the question would be, if there is, you know, what's the analog of the black hole in space time in the quantum mechanics case? Sure, sure. I, 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 I was asking a much, much more basic question, which I don't quite see the connection to geometric phase. That was all. Well, I'm not sure there is a connection. It was my speculation about what would be the a possible interpretation of. So, in in the case, you know, that's I mean, the, thing. The, the the ground level interpretation is the you know is the interpretation that we've kind of been hand waverly using since the start of the project, I guess, which is this this notion that you know it implies there are some superpositions which cannot be collapsed down to a single classical eigenstate, right? It, 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 which, which is your sort of, you can't form a classical thought sort of thought experiment. Um, whether that can be formalized in terms of geometric phases, I don't know. Well, um, geometric phases may be a red herring because they may be more spatial. They may be bringing some in some more spatial. In their normal formulation, they involve some kind of spatial component. But the, the right. question that we're asking here is, you know, in the general relativity case, the presence of the, the failure of, of homotopic equivalence of two paths is a statement of the presence of some kind of space-time singularity. And so the question then is, what is the analogous kind of singularity in branchial space? Right, right, right. So, so I mean, the, and the point that I'm making is that, okay, so the reason for this kind of intuition about, uh, you know, measurement as completion, or a, a way you can think about that intuition is that now when, if I'm defining like a homotopy transfer, you know, just like I can think about diffeomorphisms in, in space time as being like homotopy transformations. Um, if I think now about homotopy transformations of paths in the multi-way evolution graph, they become a bit like, they become essentially um, projections of, you know, of one vector onto another yes. vector. Um, and so if there's a, if there's something like a topological obstruction, what that's telling me is that there is a vector I, th th there is a particular pair of vectors where I cannot project one onto the other, and therefore I cannot perform a you know a conventional um, measurement. I, I, I cannot collapse if I have a superposition of those two state vectors. I can't collapse them down to a single eigenstate. Now, normally you don't, th one doesn't think about that because the Hilbert space that you're operating in is something that's very very topologically simple. But if you had something, if you had something that was like a Hilbert that looks locally like a Hilbert space, but could have globally more interesting topological properties. You could have the situation that you have a pair of equivalence classes of rays, but where there's a topological obstruction in between them, that means I can't project one onto the other. Isn't isn't that what happens with super selection rules? I think so. Yeah. So so I think if you, if you had yes, I think you're right that if you had different, you could have rays in different super uh, super selection sectors, and then I couldn't project them. But that's a very trivial case. That's like a cosmological event horizon. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, the, I I guess what what we're kind of inching towards is this prediction that. There is a um, there is a much more topologically interesting structure that is like a Hilbert, you know, that, that's that's kind of locally uh, homeomorphic to a Hilbert space, perhaps, um, and which but we, and which has things like super selection sectors, but also much more interesting, you know, other kinds of um, topological features. See, back in the day when people were talking about like the QCD vacuum, there's always the question of what, uh, you know in a sense, what are the allowed possible configurations and how can you, you know, are they continuously deformable into each other and so on? I mean, that, that was a, yeah, I mean, people got very excited about algebraic topology and instantons and things like that in that connection. But I don't really know 
And, and that has probably segued into some stuff that's being done. I don't know. Do you know how that, 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 um, no, uh, it's, no, that's, that's above my reading level. Um, we need I, a string theorist. We need a, we need a pet string theorist to I'm join sure us. Xerxes will have it. will have opinions. Um, well, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe that's some, um, uh, all right. So that's, but that's a, um, actually if, it's, if, if he happens to be around, we could see if he could join us and we can ask him this question. Can we, um, uh, um, the, um, but well, I think I, this, go ahead. I, I was going to mention that. I mean, the, the, this, the, the issue with this whole question is that, I mean, it comes back to this. Um, I think I've, I think I point this, I think I pointed this out at this, uh, the emergent space time workshop thing at, at, in Arizona state and, and Sean Carroll and people sort of agreed that this was possibly a thing that was inter that was worth pursuing, but having this kind of, a, you know, a time extended version of Hilbert space, you know, so, so, something, something which is to Hilbert space, what, uh, you know, space, space time, time is to space, is ordinary space, because it's very difficult to reason about topology, about notions of event horizons, topological obstructions and things. If you just have a single space like hypersurface, you have to assume loads of stuff. But if you know the full causal graph, it's much easier. The problem is, although with the causal, you know, with the space time causal graph, we know what geometrical structure that should correspond to in the limit. With the multi-way causal graph, it's much less clear because there isn't a, you know, there, there isn't a time extended analog, a Lorentzian version of a projective Hilbert space as, you know, at least based on the people I've spoken to that, that doesn't well, seem. Okay. So, so what we need is an analog of Minkowski space for, for this multi-way causal graph. At, at, at the, as the first level. Yes. Um, and why is that so hard to get? I mean, so it's a Hilbert space with what is the metric for that thing? Well, so, so yeah, at, at a basic level, you could imagine constructing something, some kind of Lorentzian manifold whose foliation structure was given by projective Hilbert spaces. Right, that's what you need. But it, right. I don't know why, why it's Lorentzian in particular. I mean, does it, what do we know about its metric? Or is it the case, is the T squared minus X squared metric of, Loren of Minkowski space, is that just a hack? Well, in a sense, it's a hack. I mean, it, I mean this, this comes back to the, the, um, the thing about, you know, uh, Sylvester's law of inertia and those things, right? That, that, you, that if you're going to make, okay, so the, the, the conformal invariance of, uh, that's required by relativity requires that space-like and time-like separations be, you know, well-defined. That, you know, if, if you have a time-like right. separation, you can't be confused for a space-like separation and so on. And so there's this general principle, the Sylvester law of inertia, which says that if you want to, if, you, if there are sort of, if there are n different types of separation that you need to keep well-defined, then your metric needs to have n different signs of eigenvalues. So for so for space time, that means that you you need you, your metric needs to have you know positive eigenvalues and negative eigenvalues, or maybe positive and imaginary, or you know something like that. Um, and, and you know which is why we have a you know an x squared minus t squared uh, x squared minus t squared or something like that, something of that form, or an x squared plus uh, i t squared or whatever. Um, in a sense, you could say that that's a hack. Um, well, so what, what about the possibility that in the Hilbert space case, we need an infinite spectrum? Of those kinds of you know going off into the the infinite in other words we've got negative numbers we've got imaginary numbers we've got you know quaternions we've got whatever you know what is the generalization of that for arbitrary numbers of signs right right I, again this is i mean this is the problem i, I just you know based on people I've spoken to who I, who I expected to know stuff about this. I don't think this is a mathematical structure that's been seriously investigated. As you say, it's kind of, it's what happens when you take division, if you take some infinite limit of division algebras. Right. And, and then add a, well, you take some infinite limit of division algebras and then add one other, one more sign. Um, because presumably you need to separate the, the t you know, you need to be able to distinguish the time-like separations between all the infinitely many other separations in the Hilbert space. Um, and that's, as far as I'm able to discern, that's a completely new kind of mathematical structure. Um, Let's understand what it would involve. So, I mean, the, the, what, what you're saying is the, you have to distinguish because you've got this infinite number of directions in the Hilbert space that all, see, the, the, the thing that's weird is you've got all these things. Okay, a metric is you've got two points, you want to find out how far apart they are. You are, you are trying to return a number from two you know, coordinate positions effectively. Two positions in the space, you want a number that relates them. And the question is, how do you get an individual number? Because, yeah, I mean, and this to some extent, I think relates to the whole model making in, in um, 
multi-way systems and proof graphs and so on. Because in a sense, to get that individual number is to be able to answer a question. Like if you know the things outside the light cone, you get that in a single number in the, in the metric for Minkowski space, right? Right, right, exactly. I mean, you, you, could, you can even think of the metric as being like a multiplication, as being sort of the, the generalization of a multiplication table in model theory, but to space time. Right. Let's, let's think about that for a second, because I think that's interesting. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, if we think about, can you get from here to there? So we've got a graph and the graph already exists. And we're asking, find me a path from here to there. It's a well-defined algorithm, right? But an alternative thing we could do is to say, I've got a graph generating function. By generating function, I mean something like a multi, you know, multi-way, you know, multi-way rule or whatever. And then I ask, given that generate, generate, I don't want to call it generating function because that means something else. But but um, given that I, I think function I, I, for evolution function is the terminology we use in multi-way systems. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Right. So given an evolution function, um, find me whether a path exists. That's kind of the the um, uh, the the kind of um, uh, the dynamic version of what you are perhaps statically being able to answer with a metric. In other right. words, does a path exist? Okay, that's asking the question: Is there a, uh, you know, is there a positive distance between these? Is it a time-like separation because it's a positive distance in the Minkowski metric and so on? Um, right. It, it, it's it's analogous, I guess, to in GI, if you know, instead of if you didn't specify the space time, you know, as just a single lump, but instead you gave a space, you know, you gave a Cauchy problem, you just gave a space like hypersurface, and you had some field equations, and then you want to you want to say what is the distance between uh, you know these two points? What you know, once I constructed the you know the the, the future Cauchy development or something, that's the analog of, of your dynamic multi-way pathfinding, I guess. I think so. Yeah, right. But so I, so that uh, so exactly. Lexi said, right. Ago, oh, good. Way. Okay. Well, we can ask him a question then. Um, but, but let's, uh, we, we're just on a roll here for one second. Let me, let me just, and perhaps that will give Xerxes some context too. Um, the, um, we're, um, uh, we're talking about the difference between finding a metric, which is this thing packaged with as a number, and finding the existence of a path or finding how long the path is. Because you could ask, okay, so the length of the path. Should be the, the, okay. The, okay, here's here's one of the points. One characteristic of a path is how long it is, which is a number, presumably. And that number is presumably related to the number that the metric returns. Well, it it, it had better be if if yeah, if you want the thing to have a continuum geometry. Yes, right. But the point is that there is more to the path than just that number. Right. Right. Because the path wiggles all over the place and you could specify all kinds of other things about the path. Now, the surprising thing in your law of inertia story, okay, is that a path really always is going to have a length, isn't it? And therefore, there is some number that comes out. What is the consistency between all these different pieces of hackery associated with imaginary numbers and negative numbers and so on, and the outright definite integer, which is the length of your path? Which of those choices of t squared, x squared, i t, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is going to correctly give you the length of that path? Well, any of them will, right? I mean, they, they, they will all give you a well. I mean, that's that's why we say it's a metric because you know it's it, they will all satisfy the axioms of of what anyone would reasonably define as a distance. Right, but I mean, in the in the case where we have the discretized space time or the discrete multi way path graph or whatever, we just, it's just a counting. It's just a number. You know, we've got this node here. We've got another node there. It's just an integer that tells us how far it is apart. Ah, uh, it's not quite that simple, right? Because suppose you have a causal graph, and yes. we want to find the distance between a pair of arbitrary vertices. If they are time like separated, sure, it's trivial. It's just you find a path. If they're space like separated. It's not so trivial. We could find a path in the associated hypergraph, but then we have to define some kind of conversion ratio. How how many okay. hyper? Okay, per this is but this is exactly how the hack is unrolling, right? And I think this is the way no, we no, understand no, how no, to no, generalize the hack. That's that's what the you know the, the 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 eigenvalues hack is exactly telling you how do I distinguish between a hyper edge 
vert, you know, hyper edge um, length versus a causal edge length versus a whatever. Well, but in some sense, it's going in the direction of an anti-chain, right, in the post set. So in one, in one case, you're, you're just following, you know, you're following a happy, you know, chain going down through the post set. That's the time-like separation, right? Then the other possibility is you go, you go anti-chaining off in the space-like direction, right? Right. Right. Okay. So what, what, what is being said here is that there's, in a sense, there's just chains and anti-chains. And that's what you get if you've got two of these kind of, you know, if the story is that there are two different, uh, you know, packaging, it's, it's just chains and anti-chains. But what right. you're effectively saying is in the multi-way causal graph, there isn't just one kind of anti-chain. Right. Because you have space-like and you have branch-like separation, right? And, and you have time-like. And the space-like and branch-like both manifest as anti-chains. That's where it gets a bit confusing. And how would you characterize the difference between those anti-chains? Uh, well, so you, at a purely structural level, you can't. And that Except it, in the token event graph, you can. Or an expression event graph. In as much as I understand what that is, I think that is true, yes. Well, so just to, just to talk about that for a second. I mean, in the expression event graph, what happens is the, the branch-like separations are an event is the place where it branches because those are, whereas the space-like separations are an expression is where it branches. Because by, by branching at an expression, what we mean is different parts of that expression went to different places. Right, Otherwise right. known as, you know, there's a space-like, you can associate that with something space-like. Sure. Um... But in effect, all that's doing is you're just because you're you're ju you're just taking that thing and you're tagging every vertex with whether or not it's uh, you know an expression or an event. We might as well just tag uh, you know separations with whether they're space like or you know it's the the the, the point the point is in both senses you have to you have to supply some additional information that's that's not just in the structure of the graph, um, and in fact that had better be the case. Because in a sense, the fact that one cannot distinguish, because these both manifest as anti-change and therefore one cannot distinguish space-like and branch-like separation is, I think, essentially where holography is going to make, make yes, itself. Yes, 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 yes. Right, right. I mean, that, that's the, the origin of holography is this concept that it is, it's just an anti-chain, you don't know which kind, whether it's a spatial anti-chain or a quantum anti-chain. Right, right. And, and also, by the way, at a more mundane level, I suspect, I think I even wrote a Q&A about this, I, I at least suspect is also the origin of wave particle duality. Um, that in a sense, you cannot, if you have a bundle of geodesics, you can't distinguish whether they're a collection of test particles, i.e. just purely spatial causal you know, trajectories, or a wave packet, i.e. a collection of branchial sort of uh, paths, or some combination of the two. Um, that right, but, but let's come back for a second to this claim about Hilbert space and um, the statement about the difficulty of finding the analog of Minkowski space for Hilbert space, for right. time extended Hilbert space. The question there is what, uh, and this is a story of the multi-way causal graph, right? This is the question of what is the, what is the you know, the continuum limit of the multi-way causal graph and we're making claims about the fact that there are two kinds of anti-chain, but what is the claim about the multi-way causal graph? Does it have an infinite number of distinct kinds of anti-chains? Well, it, I, I don't think it's entirely clear, right? Because the um, it depends on whether just knowing that things are branch-like separated is enough level is enough granularity, or whether you also need to have uh, you know, whether there exist other notions of separation within the branch-like separations. And right, I, I which I'm sure that there do, because this is, this is probably, I mean, in that, uh, okay, so now we can ask a question to Xerxes, if Xerxes is, is here. Um, so we're, we're talking about homotopy in the context of general relativity and in the context of um, uh, quantum mechanics. Okay, so in general relativity, we have two different paths. You know, we've got two points, we have two different paths, and we can, you know, there is homotopic equivalence between those paths, so long as there wasn't a black hole in between the two possible, you know, GD6. The question is, in the quantum case, what is the analog of that, of such a structure? What is the analog of the causal structure of space-time? What is its analog in, in quantum mechanics?
Xerxes is either on mute or, or hasn't doesn't no, have no, anything no. to I, say. I, I'm thinking. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, why, why why do you want the direct analog? Uh, why don't you instead want to think of it this way that whatever structures you have on space time, if you look for some projection of it, probably some branchial projection, uh, that would correspond to some quantum degrees of freedom of that. Of, of whatever structures you describe in the in the bulk of space time. I didn't quite understand that. I mean, one of the things we were talking about a few minutes ago was this question of whether there are two homotopically equivalent paths in the quantum case. And, you know, Jonathan was making the point that in a sense to get from one path to another in the quantum case is essentially a projection. And one case we know where you can't do projections is when you have different super selection sectors. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what the generalization, I mean, super selection sectors sound like they're a very simple minded topological sort of uh, uh, dissection or something of quantum, uh, of the of space of quantum states. The question is, what are, is there a more sophisticated analog of that than, than pure, uh, you know, than just the super selection sector idea? So in other words, is there some, is there some notion of uh, that, I mean, this presumably should have come up in categorical quantum mechanics, I would think. This question of whether the, um, there is some non-trivial topology in, um, in essentially the space of quantum states. I mean, the only non-trivial topology I know about is super selection sectors. I think there might be, um, but I, I also think that there are, well, I don't know. Does, any, does this ring any bells? Not directly. I mean, uh, I, I, I would have thought that if we can rather address the inverse problem, we assume that there is some kind of, uh, we assume that the holographic projection of some space time does have quantum degrees of freedom. And then you can, from that, try to infer what would be the projection of these homotopic space-time uh, uh, space structures on this projected Hilbert space. I see, I see, I see. So use holography and ask the question, what is the, from the ADS side to the CFT side, what is the projection of a black hole in the ADS side onto yeah. the CFT side? Yeah. That has to be known. What, what is that, is that known or, or is that, um, I mean, that, that seems like the kind of thing one should be able to work out. What would be the analog in, um, Ah, uh, what would it be? Um, Just as a, as, a, as a philosophical point, that seems better as a consistency check than as a, an initial calculation. It seems good. I mean, if, if the goal is essentially to, do, to, for, to have holography arise naturally as a consequence of space-like versus branch-like separations, knowing what the, you know, what the CFT projection of an ADS black hole is would be a good way to check that that you know, that, that uh, emergence is actually occurring correctly. I don't yeah, think right. you want to sort of bake it in a priori, if you see what I mean. Right, right. I mean, sure. if, if, if you knew something better, then one would start with first principles that I'm just saying that you're uh, working backwards, you might be able to try to identify the, the substructures, uh, the sub homotopic structures that exist in the space time, and then later on, try to put it together to try to define it without knowing what the projection should be. Right. Okay, but let's, right. okay. But, just one one comment. I mean, a, a, a le much less sophisticated comment, but just um, the closest mathematical structure that I'm aware of to what we want here, I think, is essentially twister space, because in in, in twister space you have. I mean, that that is a time ex you know it's a complexified time extended thing that has this mapping to Minkowski space by the Penrose transform, and also at least in the case where the holomorphic functions have this. If you have two holomorphic functions. On that twister space, and they have the same degree of homogeneity, then Penrose showed that you can take, you can define an inner product on them, and that you know that gives you an inner product space. You so there's there's a way from a twister space that you can construct a Minkowski space and an associated Hilbert space, um, and the, the the problem is that construction is not particularly general, and if there's if there's a way that we can we can have something that's in the same spirit. And again, where we can effectively take uh, inner products of arbitrary holomorphic functions uh, and map onto more general class, you know, kinds of space times, that would be much closer, I think, to, to what we really want here. And, right. and the, the thing that's special in the, in the twister space case, right? It's complex projective space, which has specifically has various attributes that have to do with the properties of complex numbers. 
Yes, and, and also specifically has to do with the properties of, of the number four, right? And, and, and the fact that there are these various double covers and nice properties in the Mobius, you know, the, 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 the fact that I, that I can do a, a Riemann sphere stereographic projection uh, it, it, in the way that is required depends on me being in, in you know, projective four space. Um, okay, so how would one generalize that? So, I mean, in the, in the case of what, what should happen is, so the question would be, all right, so first point is, we believe that our hypergraphs or causal graphs, whatever, you know, the hypergraphs limit to manifolds, the causal graphs limit to Lorentzian manifolds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What would it even mean? What, what is the essence of twisterness, so to speak? I mean, because twisters specifically, they're using what, CP4 or something, right? The, is that right? The CP2, right. CP4. Um, complex projective force space, right? Uh, well, yeah, so, so CP2 is the, is the um, it, it depends whether, you, whether you're talking about the projective, um, wh whether you're talking about where the, where the self-dual connections are or whether the actual, where the actual twister space is, but the, uh, yeah, CP2 or CP3, depending on which one. Okay, but, but so what is the essence of being twistery? Uh... <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure what you mean. Well, what I mean by that is there is a, an elaborate mathematical structure that arises because, as you say, there are lots of equivalences between CP2 and this, I forget what all of them are, that there's a equivalence with SO4 somewhere in the picture. There's all, all kinds of other things. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and those equivalences will not in general exist. But the question is, what is the... It, it, okay, those equivalences if I'm remembering correctly, and you were saying this, um, are giving you both the equivalence to rotation groups, you know, to space-time transformations, and equivalence to, to some kind of uh, uh, Hilbert spacey type thing, right? Right. Which right. is exactly what we're talking about in doing space-like versus branch-like projections of the multi-way causal graph. Exactly. So, so in a sense, twister theory is based on what you might uncharitably characterized as an algebraic coincidence, which is the fact that SU2, 2, is a quadruple cover of the conformal group of uh, one plus three dimensional Minkowski space. Okay. Uh, okay. The, the problem is that what we're trying to, the, the object that we're trying to define here must work even in cases where such algebraic coincidences do not hold. Exactly. And that, that's right. what I'm, struggling to get right. my brain around. Right, well, but, but, but I mean, the fact is that it's the same kind of thing as saying that, you know, we don't have precise uh, rotational invariants, but we have, we don't have precise translational invariants, but we have something which in the continuum limit works that way. So the question is, and we believe that in the continuum limit, the branch-like projection and the space-like projection will work, which will be a holography statement, basically. And so the question is, um, what, well, let's see. Um, I mean, in, in a sense, you could potentially, I mean, this needs to be worked out in much more detail, but you could potentially formalize that as some kind of statement about gauge transformations in the multiway system versus gauge transformations in the causal graph, right? Because the, the, the invariance of the twister space under SU2, 2 is some kind of multiway system, you know, uh, gauge transformation invariance. Whereas the invariance under the conformal group is some kind of causal graph gauge transformation invariance. And what twister space, in the particular case of CP3, you're saying that those, you know, those two transformation groups up to quadruple cover are, are actually the same. And what we are wanting is some kind of extension of that, which, it, which is presumably some kind of compatibility between gauge choices in the multi-way evolution graph versus gauge choices in the causal graph, I would guess, but. Yes, I mean, something like that. I mean, so, so it's going to be, it is some kind of, hmm. well, gauge choices. Okay, is it a question of the mutual foliatability of the multi-way graph and the multi-way causal graph? Right, right. So, or, or yes, or in other words, what it's saying is that up to some degeneracy given by the quadruple cover, if you pick a foliation of the multi-way evolution graph, it determines a foliation of the causal graph and vice versa. And, the, and, and they are both, both objects are invariant under the same uh, 
you know, under the same uh, gauge transformation group? The, it's some. Um... So isn't that more uh, something one can understand why I'm uh, looking at the vibration structure? Because the, the way these things are vibrated uh, give us a good understanding of how, how we might move from uh, one to the other, how we might replace uh, foliations in one case and vibrations in the other. Let me understand that. So in the case of, so I think I understand foliations in that, I mean, both the multi-way graph and the, and the multi-way causal graph are foliatable, right? There's a meaningful sense of having anti-chains in those ty types of systems. Okay, so what is, what, is the, what is the idea of vibrating those things? So, you, you, so, so I'm just saying that vibration is, uh, so vibration is some sort of dual process of, of the foliations. In the foliations, you're cutting through the various branches. In the vibration, you're separating the branches themselves. It's a sort of dual process, but in one, you're making manifest the branchal structure, and in the other, you're making manifest more the causal structure. But so what are you trying to achieve in a, in, a, in a vibration? What is the property that the thing is supposed to have? That, that the fibers should be separated in some way? What, what is the actual definition of what you need? And what is the analog of that? Then I'm gonna ask, what's the analog of that in general relativity? I mean, I understand the analog of foliation in general relativity is making space like hypersurfaces. What's the analog in, in a vibration in general relativity? Well, I'm, this, if we have such a structure, the analog, uh, uh, the analog is more something that we can try to make in twister space, where looking at uh, looking at one uh, uh, one one geometry versus the other is this transformation, which might have some parallels in the way that is done in twister spaces. I I think one of the interesting features of what you're talking about, Xerxes, is that there is a class of fibers in the multi-way evolution graph that give you foliations of the of the associated causal graph, and it's not. I mean, that, that, that's, that's already quite an interesting mathematical connection. Um, Why are you saying that that's the case? A, a, a fiber, okay, what, what is a fiber in this case? A fiber is a path or a fiber has to be a, a distinguished path that are somehow distinguished and separated. I think to be a valid fiber for this vibration, don't you, doesn't it have to be the case that you can't have these things interweave with each other? Just like in a foliation, you have to have separated space-like hypersurfaces that are not, that can't intersect with each other. Well, it can be a non-trivial fiber. Uh, it, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, not, not every fiber is just a cross product. If it's non-trivial, you might still be able to identify the, the branches of the fiber, but nonetheless, they are, they are kind of globally, they have a non-trivial topology. And, and in a sense that that's required in order for this thing to be quantum mechanical, right? That, that you know, one, one, of the, one of the points that I, I think, well, Xerxes, I think was really the, the, the first to, to point this out and it, we, we put it across in the first ZX paper was that in a sense, the fact that, uh, that our paths merge in the multi-way evolution graph is why this monoidal product that we get of, of multi-way paths is not just a straightforward Cartesian product. And is in fact a more it's something more like a Kronecker product, although it's not quite a Kronecker product either. It's like it's a Kronecker product with some additional gluing transformation that I think is still not completely fully understood. Uh, but the point is, if if it were if everything were purely separable and therefore you had a topologically trivial vibration, as Xerxes said, then that that composition operation would just be a Cartesian product, and you would have just pure classical physics. The fact that that isn't the case is kind of what what makes the thing significant. Yeah, and, and right. The, the point that I'm making is that in general. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to kind of to, to, to map between, you know, vibrations of one space and foliations of another space. But in our particular case, we know that the, you know, the, 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 the causal graph foliations define some updating sequence. And that updating se sequence will correspond to a particular multi-way evolution path, which means that there is a, I mean, obviously that this correspondence is not bijective, but there is a correspondence between a certain class of, uh, of um, multi-way evolution fibers and, causal graph foliations. And more generally, I think, I mean, this is a place where, um, to take it back to the start of this conversation, I think where, the, where this categorical formalism that we've been developing may actually be helpful, because in a sense, what it's telling us, I think, is that, there, that this sort of duality that, or not really, du not quite duality, but quasi-duality that Xerxes mentioned between foliations and vibrations can be formalized as something like the distinction between uh, you know, monoidal versus sequential composition of morphisms, and that and that that may offer, may offer a more general way of kind of formulating this picture. 
What is the, okay, let's take it to basics. What is the definition of a vibration for our, for our purposes? What has to be true for something to be a vibration? Well, you, I mean, okay, so, so, so for, formally speaking, all, all that you're doing is you're, you're, you're parameterizing some bigger topological space by means of a smaller topological space, which is, which is your base. But, which right? you then go and, you know, and sort of scan down in that right. smaller topological space. Right, right, right. So for us, what that's saying is I'm going to parameterize part of this multi, so I, what I'm, you know, if we just care about individual multi-way paths, what I'm doing is I'm parameterizing that space by some pure, you know, pure path graph kind of structure. Parameterizing which space? The, the multi-way evolution? The multi-way evolution graph space. By a path graph. By the way, I mean, it is of course true. I mean, this the merging of paths is the source of quantum entanglement in our world. That's, I mean, that's, if it didn't, if they didn't merge, nothing would entangle, so to speak. And although that merging, okay, in any case, but, but back to, but let's not go down that, that path. But so again, the intuition here is you want something where essentially you are just, you know, running it down these fibers, just like, but as you're pointing out, there are mergers and things like that. So the fibers, so it isn't a trivial thing that you're just running it down the fibers. Right, right, so, sure. So this, the, 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 the vibrations you end up with, or the, you know, in the simpler case, the fiber bundles are topologically non-trivial. They'll have, no, you know, they'll have non-zero twisting and things. Okay, okay. But, all right, but, but coming back, all right, so, I mean, we got a couple of things going on here. One is understanding the analog of black holes in the branch in branch hill space, which we think, you know, our qualitative understanding is they're kind of like qubits that just hang out and don't get affected by the rest of the universe. But what will be the generalization of that? What is the, I don't even know, I'm embarrassed to say, what is the analog of, hmm, I mean, isn't it, isn't that, well, I'm trying to think, is, is, that, is that the analog of particles in quantum field theory? A lump of, I mean, is that, is that in fact the, the long believed claim that particles are the quantum analog of black holes? So in other words, the, the statement that you have something which has a, you know, we've sort of believed that a qubit, which you know, freezes time and preserves itself without evolution, is the analog, is, is the quantum frame analog of a black hole in the general relativity case. So the question would be, what, you know, what is the analog of a, I mean, what is a quantum event horizon? A quantum event horizon is something where the, you know, where decoherence does not, where, where, you, where you're freezing that particular quantum degree of freedom and you believe there's a sort of classical conclusion for it. Hmm. All right, well, anyway, Jonathan looks like he's getting distracted looking up something. No, no, sorry. I, I'm just, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to this question. I mean, um... Okay, I'm not, I'm not a quantum field theorist. So I, I can't. I can't really comment. The all right. Okay, but, but let's. Okay, can we get, can we go to a different different path for a second? Talking of paths and things like that, um, I want to come back to your approach of proof to proof transformations, aka path to path transformations, which was where we started saying you know the obstruction to a proof to proof transformation in general relativity is the presence of some kind of uh, you know, complicated singularity in space-time. We don't quite understand what that analogous thing in the in branch hill space is. The question is, in your proof-to-proof -proof transformation dynamics, what is... Okay, so you have an underlying sort of axiomatic system, and then you have a system that represents proof-to-proof -proof transformation. 
What is the relationship between the underlying axiomatic system and the proof to proof transformation system? Right. I mean, so th this is where homotopy type theory kind of comes in. Right. And, and it's, it's a good thing that we have Xerxes on this call as a, as a kind of backup. Um, so that what, what you're describing there is exactly essentially the lifting from the space of the underlying type to the homotopy space of that type. Right. Because huh. the, in, in, in the in the space <coughs> of the type, every every path is well, every, every point is a term. Every path is a proof. Whereas if you construct its associated uh, if, if we go up and we construct this associated homotopy space, now, okay, for, so from a topological point of view, now every point is a path in the, uh, in the lower space and every path is a homotopy. And, and proof theoretically, the way we interpret that is now every point is a proof and every path is a proof of equivalence. Right, between proofs. So, proof yeah, exactly. of equivalence between proofs. Right, right. right. So, what, so what we're doing when we, t when we take a multi-way path so we, you know, we have an underlying multi-way system. That's our, that's like ours with, with some rule. That's and that rule is like a type, you know, a baseline type constructor. Then we take a path, and we, we and from that path we extract its associated proof graph. That proof graph we can now construct a multi-way system for using the diagrammatic reasoning rules for proofs. And the claim is that that if the if the underlying multi-way system is like the layer one, you know, type space, then this new multi-way system for that proof is like the homotopy space. For that, for that underlying multi-way system. Right. Right. So let me just understand that. So, so your, you know, your proof-to-proof -proof transformation rules, your proof, your proof multi-way system, we might call it, which is a multi-way system where this, where this, where the states are proofs. Right. right. Okay. So my question is: given an underlying multi-way system where the proof is constructed by underlying multi-way rules, like a string multi-way system or something. What is the structure? So, so in a sense, okay, so take a very naive case. Let's consider a graph. So we could have a find shortest path in the graph. We understand what that is. We've got two, two nodes in the graph. We just find the shortest path. We could ask a different question, which I don't think people usually ask in graphs, but maybe they do. Given two paths in a graph, what is the transformation between those two paths? What is the geodesic, you know, geodesic between those paths? What, what is that in graph theory? Is that an operation people do in graph theory? I, it's not one that I'm aware of, um, although it's, it's certainly one that we've investigated in the context of this homotopy project, because I mean, that, 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 that is the graph theoretic analog of a homotopy, the, you know, the, the, the transformation you've just defined. Right, but so, I mean, if we think about that as a function, you know, just like we have a function find, find shortest path, we could have a function called find shortest tomotopy between paths, right? Right, right. I mean, and, and this is, you know, this is very much the same as, it's the whole relationship of um, vibrations to foliations or, you know, uh, morphism composition to monoidal composition, et cetera. The, the, these, what we're discovering is that there's, um, you know, okay, so li like in category theory, for every category, there's a sort of there's a dual category that you get from reversing all the arrows. For for us, what we're discovering is also there's a, there's another notion of duality, which is for every concept, there is a dual notion of that concept that you can get by kind of moving, you know, ac across the other way through the multiway system. If you see what I mean, Mo you know, moving in parallel rather, rather than moving in sequence. And that, well, that's but, right, which is the difference that you're dis you're distinguishing between ordinary categories and the monoidal categories. I still think the name monoidal categories is just horrible, but anyway, the we could call them vibration categories or something, and foliation categories in some sense. That, that's that's even that's even worse. Vibration has a very technical meaning in category theory, and it's it's not that. And it's not the same. Okay, fine. Well, all right. We can call them. Um, well, we could call them time-like categories and space-like categories. That's not completely crazy. Not bad. The, I mean, that actually might make some sense. Um, I mean, then the only difference is that it's it's like. Uh, you know, it's time-like and non-time-like because the non-time-like could be branch-like, space-like, whatever. Right, right. Although probably more likely it's branch-like in these cases. Right. Well, we could say, we could, we could generalize it and say something like chain and anti-chain categories or something. Yeah, that would make sense. Time, yeah, uh, and then we don't have a notion of time. The homotopies, sometimes they also call it homotopy type and categories where the end denotes what level of uh, morphisms you're allowing it to have. So if you're having these uh, these uh, 
proofs between proofs or these uh, these these arrows between paths that build a higher homotopy then you would say if the first thing was just a ordinary one category this would be a, a two category or a double category or something so you could call it a homotopy type n category or a multiway system of a homotopy type n category fair enough fair enough okay all right but anyway so in the function find homotopy what does it return so an ordinary thing returns a path a path graph basically an ordinary find shortest path returns a path graph what does a find homotopy return presumably it returns something it's got to return something which describes the deformation from one from one path graph to another path graph what does it return what is the data structure that it returns well i mean obviously the, the this is not necessarily the optimal thing to do but one way you one where you can parameterize it is you just say I'm going to return a path for each pair of uh, vertices on the two, you know, along the. I, I just I construct a bijection if I can between the two paths, assuming they're the same length, and then just for each I pair I, I return a path. Right. Okay. So that would generalize. So in a sense, then you're you're making a. But those paths might themselves they don't necessarily have to be sort of streaming paths. They could they can intersect each other, right? You're you're right. just defining. There exists a path, perhaps even a geodesic path, between each point. And what does, but it's not its corresponding point, right? How does that work? That one path could have 100 nodes, the other path could have 30 nodes. Right, right, right. So, so, so in, in the case where there isn't a bijective correspondence, I mean, the more, in the most general case, it becomes much harder to see how you would do this, right? Because what, what you want to have then is for each possible... What you what you want to have a you know you would want to have a list where each element is a possible assignment of vertices in one path to vertices on the other path where that assignment is neither injective nor surjective in general and each and and for you know for each pair of vertices in that assignment there is an, is, an, is an associated path. Right. So that's like n one times n two. It's a it's a matrix of paths basically. Right. Right. And and. Sorry, Xerxes. No, finish your point. I was just adding to that. I, okay. All I was going to say was that, so crucially, that this the, the fine homotopy function, as you define it, should only return the shortest paths for each of those, or it should only return one path between each pair of vertices in, you know, in that assignment. Because then, the, the, you know, the, the, the whole point about going, because, because the, there's this fact that we can go to infinitely many sort of higher homotopies, the reason I'm saying it should only return one is because if we tried to return all of them, we'd have to return the whole infinite hierarchy. Because the point is that for each for each of those you know, sort of homotopic transformations, each of those paths between those corresponding points on the two initial paths, I also I can also uh, recursively apply fine homotopies to those paths as well, and so on. And 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 the and the point about this infinite the existence of this infinite you know Rulial growth and deep limit is that I can continue recursively applying fine homotopy indefinitely. In, in a, at least in a large class of cases. Um, sorry. So anyway. Just to understand what find homotopy returns, it would return a, an n by, n1 by n2 array of path graphs. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay, so then the next level, just to generalize further, is a mapping from that, from one of those things. So in a sense, it's a little bit confusing because the first level, what happens at the next level when you're mapping one of those homotopies onto, a, onto another homotopy? If, if you like, one, one way to, uh, before we make it more complicated by taking parts of different lengths, uh, by taking them of, uh, of the same length, there is this intuition you can gain where if they are of the same lens and you match the arrows, as Jonathan said, in, in a relatively straightforward, bijective way, what you get, <laughs> Uh, for the first, uh, for, for let's say the two morphism of the first homotopy is a bunch of squares, so to say. In, in, in the top one, you can just imagine that there's a, the triangle is a self loop. So again, there's a square. So you get a bunch of squares. When you want to go to the next level, these squares map to corresponding other squares and you get cubes. So that would be a three homotopy. And this way you can, this, this way, just by adding new rules, which correspond to, to arrows, you get hypercubes, um, okay, but so, so the picture you have here, imagine you've got a grid graph or something, my favorite, Jonathan's least favorite graph. Um, the, uh, you know, you've basically got some kind of chain mail type p 
picture. Well, actually, I, I may be able to show a useful picture. Just, just I know, okay. I know we're, we're not making this a visual live stream, but uh, just quickly. Okay. If, no, please go ahead. Hang on, sorry. This is from my uh, the the um, geometric uh, the uh, the uh, meta geometrical metamathematics bulletin thing from from last year. So you know, here's a pair of paths that happen to have the same length, and then you know, this is essentially what the homotopy structure would look like. Right, and so so each each one of these things here is one of those squares as as Xerxes uh, has defined them, and then exactly as Xerxes says, if we if we then wanted to do if we did the same homotopy transformation between those paths between the purple paths, we would now get cubes and and, and so on up to higher dimensions. And okay, this particular picture here is is a, is kind of a fake because we've just added the edges explicitly. If we added them actually as as proper two way rules, you get something a bit more complicated that looks like that. But that's is you know, this helpful? I mean, where's the square? I mean, there. If you, if you look at the thing, if you look at any one of these things bounded by a red, yellow, and, and, and a pair of purple edges. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Right. I see what you're saying. So it's like it's like one of these. It's like a parallel transporty type thing, except they're not quite going in the same directions. Okay, it's it's two two things, and you're saying there's a there's transformations between. Aren't those why aren't those two way arrows between the, the why weren't those purple arrows? Were the purple arrows two way arrows? They are. No, they weren't. What? Oh, they are two way. Yes, they're, they're just they're just. You don't have way. to make them two way, but uh, I mean it, it's convenient, but you don't have to make them two way. Right. It it would just right. work. So so the purple arrows are, are what are called the the so so one of them is the vertical morphism, the other are the horizontal morphisms, and these squares give you exactly a double category. When you have cubes and n n n level hypercubes, then you get what is called the n fold category. And the reason we are talking in terms of squares and cubes is because in these categories, your uh, the definition allows you to do vertical and um, horizontal or any other direction morphism of these squares. So your the homotopy between paths is just vertical composition of the squares. Okay, okay, I understand. So so this, but okay. It, so in terms of your find homotopy function, just pragmatically, the way I mean, a way that can be implemented is okay. You've you've got the, the level one find homotopy function that returns, as you say, this n one by basically an n one by n two matrix of, of possible paths, right? And then, if if I recursively apply find homotopy to the pairs of paths within that matrix, I get effectively homotopies between those homotopies. Because I'm you, you don't mean the pairs of paths. You mean the, the individual at a particular matrix location. Yeah. There is a path. There's a path graph. And you say apply the, find the homotopy of path graph to path graph. So you're going to get a tensor that in, is an n1 by n2 by. Well, it, it, it's, going, it it's going to go up by a factor, but the, the next one is going to be n1, n2, n1, n2. Something like that. I mean, ultimately, it, it depends on the degeneracy of the paths of the of the horizontal paths that you're defining. Well, I think if you do it in this in this uh, array type way, where it's path to path, in the end you're defining. Does it go up exponentially or does it go up linearly? You seem to be claiming that it's going up. In other words, the 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 rank of that tensor. Right. I think I the mean, rank of the tensor goes up exponentially. Uh. Yes, that sounds I think it's right. It's a two to the n fold thing right, right. at the nth level in the uh, nth homotopy. Because you've got you 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 now you're you're trying to find homotopies between two of these tensors, and now what I'm going to have to do is pair up paths, at, you know, at the, at, at, in in the same position across the two, uh, you know, across the two tensors, and then construct another tensor from that. So yes, I think you're right. Okay, so that so then the the Rulial limit, the Grothendieckian Rulial limit, whatever we're calling it. Is um, uh, is the infinite tensor, is the infinite rank tensor, which is like an infinite hypercube, infinite dimensional hypercube, and how should we think about that in terms of, um, and and the claim is that by the time, okay, uh, you could put it in a in a sort of Texan way, it's all hypercube and no paths by the time you've by the time you've taken that limit. If you understand what I'm saying, that is, it doesn't matter much anymore. What you know, if if what's happening is as you go the nth homotopy, as you go to the next level homotopy, you're adding another dimension of the hypercube, 
Um, but in the end, the little paths that are down, the little path graphs that are in all the squares and you know, in all the boxes in the hypercube no longer matter in this limit. That would be the claim. Right, which which is which we think at least is why you get the groupoid structure rather than just you know an ordinary category structure, right? Because the, the because the paths that you're the, the homotopies you're adding are two way, right? You know, they, they are isomorphisms, and eventually they come to in the infinite limit they come to dominate over any non isomorphism sort of morphisms that you you initially had. Yeah, it's a, I mean it's a it's a I don't know quite what the analogy is, but it's a it's it's sort of a dimension always wins and you're going to higher dimension here um, by, uh, okay, interesting. So, so just to, to recap for a second on, we, we didn't quite finish on the question of your proof to proof transformations and the relationship of the proof to proof transformation rules with the underlying you know, axiomatic rules. So do your, do your proof to proof transformation rules depend on the underlying rules? Presumably they do. Uh, no, no, they don't. So they only depend on the structure. So, okay, so they are like this hypercube hyper building mechanism, which only depends on the structure of the hypercube and not on the structure of the individual paths underneath. Is that the claim? Right. And I mean, the, the hope would be that, that it's not just that they're, that they're similar, that they, the hope would be that actually they are the same, that this, I mean, the, the idea behind it, I mean, we haven't proved this yet, but, but the idea behind this diagrammatic calculus would be, or the hope would be, that this is actually a formal way of constructing these higher inductive types, right? So, 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 so when, when you're going from, when you go from the initial space to the homotopy space to the homotopy space of the homotopy space, etc., the proof theoretic intuition for what's or the logical intuition for what's happening is that you're constructing these so-called HITs, right? These higher inductive types. So you you you've started with a single with a simple inductive type, and then you construct the next higher order inductive type, and so on. And so the so the the hope would be that this. And every time you pass from the multiway path to the proof graph and then to the multiway system of the proof graph, you are constructing the next higher order inductive. You, you are producing the type constructor for the next higher order inductive type. And, and, and yeah, crucially, that shouldn't depend on the initial type constructor. You should be able to do that in a way that doesn't, and therefore, yeah, and therefore this construction should be able to be done in a way that is independent of the original multiway system rules. Okay, so you're saying given a proof okay so this is then a generic you know if you can use this to simplify proofs this is a generic proof simplifier independent of the axioms right right and and then as you know as i think you kind of pointed out yesterday and and that i think is quite an interesting idea is that therefore it's a way it's a practical way of using at least some ideas from homotopy type theory to make theorem provers more efficient because what you can do is you can have two layers of theorem prover you could have uh, one that's actually trying to prove the theorem, and then one that's doing the theorem proving over the proof graph of the first theorem prover, and then uh, and, and effectively trying to reduce that to some normal form which optimizes the proof path, and and then you know you, you in fact you could have an infinite you could have a hierarchy of n theorem provers each optimizing the proofs of the of the of the ones that come below, and what you're doing effectively then is trait is by going to this you know by by using these higher um, homotopy spaces, you are trading off. Um, time complexity for proof complexity. You're saying I, 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 I want to reduce the proof complexity at the expense of some increased time complexity. Well, but let's think about that for a second. So, I mean, you're saying, given a proof, for example, I really would like to try it on my Boolean algebra proof um, because it's been 20 years and it's still incomprehensible and it's still, you know, and it, it should just work, right? I mean, your, your diagrammatic proof calculus should just work on that proof. Is that not true? Right, right. But it's, I mean... It, it's important to note that this is not, you're optimizing for shortness, you're not optimizing necessarily for comprehensibility, which is, I suspect, a very different metric. Uh, it's a different issue, different issue, not what we're trying to do. I mean, the, the question is, what you're, what you're saying is, look, I, again, it's a little bit of an obscure thing because the proof is not necessarily a gd sick path. That is, the proof as found by the theorem prover is not necessarily a shortest path. So right. you're saying, I've got a procedure. So it, it will be like in space time, I've got a path. My spacecraft visited this planet, then this planet, then this star, then this whatever else, right? You say, that was silly. If you're just trying to get from the beginning point to the end point, there is a geodesic path that's much shorter than that. And so what you're then defining, you, you then have something which says, 
given the actual path. See, this is a little weird. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of it's kind of analogous, I guess, to a gradient descent method or something, but on proof path length, right? Indeed. You're, 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 you're taking this path, you're perturbing it, and you're just going in the direction where the proof is, you know, where, where the proof can, can be shortened. Except because it's a theorem, because you're actually doing this with a theorem prover, it can do something that's a bit cleverer than that. And, you know, it, 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 can, it can succeed in reducing to normal forms, even if they, you know, even if there are local minima and things. Uh, to some extent. I mean, as we know, theorem provers are not perfect. I mean, they're not going to get, just like if a theorem prover was perfect, it would always find the shortest path and, and this discussion wouldn't be happening. Well, I know uh, if theorem provers were perfect, they wouldn't necessarily find the shortest because I, I guess what you mean by a perfect theorem prover is one which doesn't get stuck, right? The theorem prover isn't trying. Well, if it that... finds the shortest path, it didn't get stuck. Right. I mean, but but so this is a. It's it's not trying to find the shortest path. It's trying to find it. You know, find equational proof is not attempt is not even attempting to find the shortest proof. It's just returning the first proof it finds, which is not, not necessarily the same thing. Right, but, but then, so what you're discussing with the diagrammatic proof calculus is a way of potentially evolving to the shortest proof. Right, right. And, or, and the, or, or some other, it doesn't really matter because what you've got with the diagrammatic calculus is a proof equivalence calculus. And then the question of what the cost function is for the proofs is a separate question. Right, right, but, but I, I, th I think at, a, at, a, at an immediate, pragmatic level, the obvious thing to do is just to apply the same theorem proving algorithm to the proof graph. I understand, I understand, but that will give you, yeah, it's not, is that obvious what that will give you? I mean, it. it... The, the, the point that I'm making is, okay, so, so we, we have, you can't do this just with raw out of the box find equational proof functionality, but what we now have from the ZX calculus work is a way of doing diagrammatic simplification by essentially specifying by, by saying, okay, I, I've got a multi-way operator system. It's defined by all these you know, generators and wires and things. And all I want to do is I, I'm, I'm gonna define the normal form to be the configuration of generators and wires that's minimal with respect to some metric, like you know, the, the total number of generators or something. Mm -hmm. And then we can do theorem proving with that as the, as the goal, uh, where effectively, you know, the, the, so in a sense, the right-hand side of our theorem is a pattern that it's saying, right, I don't know what the form of the right-hand side is. I, I don't know exactly what the right-hand side is, but I know what the form of it is. And, and so then I, it, and, and we, can, we can formalize that as a higher order logic uh, theorem. Um, and then that gives you a way of doing diagrammatic simplification with a, with a theorem proving algorithm. And all right. I'm proposing is doing the same thing, except now without, and we're not doing it with a ZX diagram, we're doing it with a proof graph. But the you know the the, the 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 you know the idea is the same. Okay, but so so now consider the the higher order version of that. So you do it with the proof graph, and you do it with the proof graph of the proof graph, and so on. Um, the or the what is is it obvious what that limit? The interpretation of that limit. So one thing would be find me a shortest proof, and which is to say transform a proof into the shortest proof. But the next order is transform a shortest finding of the shortest proof to a shortest, shortest finding of the shortest proof, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Right, 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 exactly. So, so, so you, you are saying this is the shortest proof that is equivalent to this other proof. But to convince me of that, you need to show me a proof of that, of that equivalence. But that proof of the, the proof of that equivalence is not necessarily optimal, right? And so, so, so if you want to right. find the optimal one of that, there's another layer and so on. And so th th this is why the hierarchy goes on. Okay, so wait a minute. So each layer is then saying, I want to get from here to here. I want to find the shortest path. Then I want to get from this path to this path. I want to find the shortest path from that path to that path. And then you keep going. What is the real interpretation of that? The shortest path between shortest paths. Hmm. What is the interpretation in terms of the Rulio multiway system of the final shortest path between shortest paths. It's the Ruleal metric. Right. Right, it's the, it is ultimately a measure of some kind of, what the heck is it? It's some kind of rule distance in this Ruleal space, I think. I'm right. Sure. 
and and then and uh, exactly please please correct me if i'm wrong or um you know if, if there's something i'm missing out here but the, the, the idea would be that that rule or metric will then determine up to weak homotopy equivalence the metrics of all layers below it uh because in a sense that that's you know that that's why the you know wh why the infinity one limit is kind of a significant one because it because it determines all of the all, all the other kind of homotopy classes up to weak homotopy equivalence Indeed. Um, I also wanted to point out that not in all cases will you be able to go uh, finding these higher structures. For, for, for example, you do need some, so I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not claiming it depends on the rules, but you do need some structure of the multi system such that uh, the, the higher squares are admissible. If, if you have, a, for example, in, in, in that case where you just have paths where there's just one, one kind of arrow connecting them, and you don't have nodes in between, you might not have enough, let's say enough space or enough nodes to create the higher squares. Or if your multi-way graph terminates, then you might simply not have enough room to build. But there are two, two uh, situations in which you could be able to build this higher homotopy structure. And that might give you some inter geometric intuition of what these shortest paths might look like. One is that your multi-way system is simply discreetly infinite and you have enough room, so to say, to build higher order squares and then your shortest paths are simply dis of discrete nature. But the more interesting case could be the following, where let's say it might not be discreetly infinite, but by adding these new rules, you're inadvertently creating more nodes, uh, more states into the system, like you saw in the second diagram of Jonathan, where you saw the, the structure, you said, where are the squares? It looked a little more complicated because it looked as if some more nodes were created. So that might be an interesting case where the limit becomes cohesive in the sense that by adding these new rules, you're not, not only just uh, filling up the squares, but you're also adding more nodes in a way you're filling up the space in a continuum like limit. And uh, my conjecture would be that, that those are the systems that approach the cohesive limit and the metric that you get might give you something closer to a, uh, to a geometry or a continuous topology, et cetera. And from there on, everything downwards just follows. So, so there, there would be some more geometric interpretation of these shorter spots, as opposed to the case where things are more of a discrete topology. But I, I, I should add that this case where that infinite limit exists and where we, where we, can, keep up, we can keep on going to the point where, where there is some cohesive limit, that is precise, ironically somewhat, that is precisely the case in which find equational proof will hang. It will not, it will not terminate, right? Because it, you know, what is happening when find equational proof doesn't terminate is that every time it's, it's computing a critical pair, it's adding a critical pair lemma to the system. And then that critical pair lemma is then introducing more critical pairs than it, than it resolved. And if that process continues going, then, that, you know, then that's a, you know, it's a non-conversion. Right. It, gets, it gets stuck in its own glue, as in it's cohesive to a, to a fault. It's, it exactly. keeps on adding cross-links. Exactly. exactly. And, and so, so the reason I say that that's ironic is because everything we've been talking about so far has been in terminating cases of, of find equational proof. But those terminating cases are precisely the case in which this infinite limit doesn't exist, right? Because it, if it terminates, it meant that it only had to go up to some, you know, to up to some finite order before it obtained a confluent rewriting system. Right. Okay. So your point is, the case where the theorem prover just tries very hard to find these paths is the case where it will keep on adding completions, and in the end, in Xerxes's point. You keep adding completions, keep adding completions, and that effectively is, is, is you know, it's, it's filling in, you know, it's filling things into the point where it's a continuous space, basically. Right. So it, it's as if, I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, you have some, I don't know, some, I'm thinking of these uh, systems where you just say a number times a, a irrational number, the floor of that. And you, you know, in that case, if it's an irrational number, you keep on filling pieces in, um, in, in uh, you know, it doesn't terminate. It doesn't, it, it just keeps filling pieces in and it's attempt to get into a cycle, for example, and it never succeeds. Right. Well, that's interesting. So, so just to understand in homotopy type theory, I mean, when somebody says there's a big payoff for homotopy type theory, um, what, well, actually, just to, just to review the, the univalence axiom of homotopy type theory. What, so that is the statement that you can treat as equivalent these things which are reachable on paths 
by this procedure. Is that too true? You can treat, well, as... as it, it, it's more a generic statement of trying to say when types would be equivalent. And if, and, and, and these types are not just ordinary types, they could be homotopy types, they could be higher order types, they could be infinity groupoids. So it's a statement of saying when an entire homotopy type is equivalent, and, and then you can just go down the order and start even talking about equivalences between subtypes of that type or between the lower order structure of that. But the axiom is basically saying when there is a path, the things should be treated as equal. Is that correct? When there is a path between what? Between two things. Right, I mean, that's, that's the statement. Well, okay, so, so I, I, think, I think what you're pointing out is that it's this, so there is a statement that if you have a path between two types, then those types are, you know, in, in, the, in the homotopy space, then those types are equivalent. The uni that's just ordinary, in a sense, that's just the ordinary statement of type extensionality. Uh, what the univalence axiom is saying is something a bit stronger. It is saying that that, that implicate that, that, you know, w when I say type equivalence is equivalent, sorry, or a path equivalence is equivalent to type equivalence. It's saying that that equivalence is itself, um, you know, a type equivalence. It's a wait slightly, it's a slightly wait more. Wait, 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 wait. So in the type space, which I view as being sort of a space of expressions, let's say, which happen to be constrained to be types, but I think that's irrelevant. Um, you know, in this expression space, basically, you're saying two things are equivalent if they are connected by a path. Correct? Well, no, no. So, so, so univalence is about is a statement about equivalences between types, not equivalences between terms. So, okay. what you want to do is treat those types as terms in some higher order space, and then say those types are equivalent if there is a path between them. Okay, what's the, what's the analogy between uh, terms going to types and the other discussion we've just had about, about um, you know, states and, and paths and homotopies? What's the analogy? What, how do I think about, okay, if in, in my world, everything is just an expression, not a type, how should I think about this you know, space of types and so on. Right, but, but I mean, even that is not really true, right? Because you're, you're not, we're not in general considering here the set of all possible expressions. We're considering the set of all possible expressions subject or, you know, generated by a particular rule. Sure. Which is, right. I mean, which is kind of just type theory in disguise or the other way around. <laughs> you know, depending well, let, let's understand that for a second. Okay, so, so in type part. theory, what we imagine is that as we generate types, we have type constructors. And what is the, what is the difference between a type construction and a multi-way rule? I'm not sure that there is one, um, but- I think they're very much the same kind of thing. I mean, a type constructor is just a way of generating one type expression from another type expression. Right, right. I, I, I mean, in a sense, you could claim that, you know, multi-way systems as they are formally defined have strictly more structure than type do but the, yeah i mean the, the the basic idea is that they are both both a type constructor and a multi-way rule are rules for generating or rules that affect that implicitly tell you which terms belong to a type and which don't or which expressions belong to a multi-way system and which don't right by the way what's the causal graph for type construction right well that's the sense in which i would claim that the multi-way system has more structure because i'm not i'm not convinced that that really exists as a concept but um in type but, construction Right, I don't know, uh, Xerxes, do you, do you have any views? No, so, so, so you're, you're, you're right that uh, in, in, in type construction, you're just looking at the terms, you're not keeping track of all the, all the causal order. So, so in, in a sense, a multi-way structure is a bit enriched compared to a typical type, but you might just classify that as some, some more, um, s s s some kind of type within a, within a category where there is causality plus the terms. But what so would be the interpretation? Do, can we get, make any guess about the interpretation of, of the causal graph in the case of type construction? Sorry, it's in the name. Can we guess what the causal graph represents? In, in, look, in, in type construction, we can imagine some whole hierarchy of types, right? We can imagine some whole multi-way graph of possible types that are being constructed. 
The question is, what is the multi-way causal graph? What is its interpretation in terms of, in some sense, the multi-way causal graph is some kind of bizarre story about the supply chain of types. What type you need to have in order to have, it's more complicated. It's, it's what type, you know, what type, what is the, what is the interdependence of, go ahead. Not operating at the level of types, it's operating at the level of terms. Well, wait a minute, a type constructor is operating at the level of types. Well, a Which type are we talking about? Is, is really just constructing terms of a given type, right? So the, yeah, the working model rule is like a type constructor, a given type, a, a given collection of type constructors is constructing the terms of that defined type. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like in our compiler, okay, we have type constructors, right? And one type of type constructor is, you know, make an array of the, these types, okay? So that is something where I'm, I'm a little confused here because I think I can make a, I can use the type constructors to construct types as well as using the type constructors to construct instances of types, AKA terms. Or am I right. totally confused? No, no, but the, the, the point is that you can think of that any type in, you know, in this sort of, Per Martin Loaf, uh, you know, uh, in inductive type theory view, you can you can think of any type as being constructed from sort of lower order types, right? Okay, any type, as well any as any instance of a type, which can be constructed using cons type constructors from other instances of a type. No, 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 no. There's no need for that confusion, right? Any type can be constructed from lower order types. Great. By, by a type constructor. Therefore, yep. the type constructor is a rule for generating terms. Because the type- rule for generating types? No, for generating terms. I'm confused. I mean, you could use it- I, I, have, you, a so I, you know, I, I have some basic types or something. You know, I, I have, uh, you know- Integers. Integers, strings, whatever. I, I don't know. Okay, let's call those my zeroth order things. So from that, I can then define a type constructor that builds a new type using strings and integers, et cetera. Like tuples, for example. Sure, but that, I mean, that's a, rather, that's a rather unconstrained case, but I could, I could introduce an, a, a more constrained version of that, right? Okay. Um, and so then the point is, so that type constructor therefore is a rule for generating all possible terms of that new type. Yes, I understand. So, you could, you could so, just as you can make a tuple of types, you can make a tuple of individual terms of the base types. Well, the two, yes, right. So, so, so when the type constructor constructs a new type from existing types and therefore is a rule for generating terms, right? Yes, it's also a rule for generating types. Well, it, you know, it generates one type. Indeed. So, the, but, that, but my point is that's not a rule, right? A, a, a rule, or at least the way okay, I think- Whatever, that, yeah, but I mean- but the, A rule is that it generates more than one thing. Right. Yes, but the but the 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 base type constructors like make it tu tuple it, array it, make it a function, those kinds of things. Those primitives of type construction can be applied to types to make whole collections of new types. That's that's true. Yes, but but the, but the particular type constructor of a you know a a, a four tuple of strings you can think of as a rule for generating terms because it, because sure. that, that, that defines Absolutely. a Absolutely, yes, I agree. Right, okay, we're all on the same page, I think. Okay, okay, so now what were you saying about the homotopy? What were you saying about univalence? You're talking about equivalence. What, what was I saying or what was Xerxes saying? I forget which of you it was now. So I, I, I think uh, what, I think initially your question was, uh, how do we think about um, uh, uh, univalence when, when you're thinking of a path between types. So one way to think about this is that you, 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 you do indeed have a type that is called the universe type, which is the universe of types. And terms of that universal type are actually types. And then you can have a path between types. But the, the kind of uh, subtlety happens that, let's say you have two types in this universe and you have a path between them. What if one is able to construct an alternate path between them? 
So then, then it becomes natural to ask whether these two paths themselves are homotopic or not. And you could keep building a tower of homotopies even between these two types. And, uh, and in general, that can happen. So, so just constructing one path is not enough to talk about equivalence uh, between them. You need to make sure that at every level, uh, you have made sure that these, these structures match. So somehow uh, univalence tries to say a little bit of, uh, at, a, at a homotopic level than at the level of a single path. So what does it say? I, I would think that it says that if you try to do this, then at every level, you'll be able to, uh, to, to try to uh, find some equivalence. Uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm not saying this precisely. Let, let me think for a second. Um, be, because if you, if you have two different paths, then you can, you can only describe the equivalence up to the next level. And, and there is yes. no reason why you cannot construct, uh, construct that. So, so, so somehow univalence uh, is, is trying to tell you what to do if you can keep going up this procedure. And I would think that uh, you'd probably have to check at every level uh, to see that uh, if, if you have two paths, then they're up to equivalent up to homotopy, then the next level is equivalent up to higher homotopy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I suppose when this whole tower is filled up, then you might be able to say that indeed these two types are equal. So you would have to do more checking than a single path. Hmm. Okay. Can I can I try a um a sort of uh, maybe a, m a more directly constructivist way possibly of thinking about this, which would be so suppose I construct a multi-way system of multi-way systems, right? So, mm -hmm. so uh, e every time I'm performing a completion, what I'm effectively doing is that that completion is a rule for deforming one multi-way system into another multi-way system. Yes. Uh, so, so, so in general, when, when we th when we're talking about applying these homotopies, we're really deforming one. We're 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 doing sort of continuous deformations between multiway systems. So I can construct a multiway system of all such deformations. That you know the the, the multiway system of possible multiway systems, which, uh, you know, so, so long as we do this in a, in in such a way that we can go you know up this whole infinite tower, as uh, th th this this will generate, I think, what Xerxes is is describing as as this type universe, right? Which is the you know the 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 type of all the type in which all terms are themselves types, right? I, th I think so, but it's also going to be this ruleal multiway graph, isn't it? Oh well, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, uh, eventually, you know, the idea is that all these all these concepts will will kind of come together. But if we if we stick with that for now, because in terms of just how we how we think about univalence, um, so then I can define a notion of equivalence between types in this universe type, mm -hmm. but you know, b based on just based on just path connectedness, effectively. And what the univalence axiom is saying, okay, so so. The first, thing, the first point I can make is that um, equality between types is the same as equivalence. You know, in other words, equality is the same as being path connected, right? And and mm -hmm. so in in that context, if we want, you know, if you want to think about it categorically speaking, what that's saying is that uh, isomorphism is really the same as equality, which is kind of you know, which which is the underlying idea of type extensionality. Um, but the univalence axiom is going a step further, and it's saying that that notion that 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 statement that um equality is equivalent to equivalence is itself a type equality and one of the implications that that has is that all of the all the notions of equality that exist lower down between terms of individual types and so you know all, all the all those notions of equality that exist at the lower levels of the hierarchy are implied by just introducing this notion of type equivalence at this highest level of the hierarchy and that's related to the fact that, as I say, that, uh, as, as we've mentioned previously, that the notions of homotopy equivalence at all lower levels are, um, are sort of determined by the weak homotopy equivalence between paths at the, you know, at, at, at the infinity level. Um, and so in, in our context, what that's telling you is that really all you need to know is the metric on the ruleal multiway system and the notion of path equivalence in the ruleal multiway system and all the other notions of metrics and, uh, and path equivalence up to weak homotopy equivalence at lower levels of the uh, lower multiway system levels are, are defined by that. So what do we know about the ruleal metric? I mean, at least in the Turing machine case that I worked out, it, it should be possible to figure out what that is. I don't even know what the ruleal metric between Turing, Turing machines is, but that's probably fairly obvious. I mean, so given, because we have the ruleal multiway graph there, 
we should be able to ask, what the heck is it? Because within the Rulio multiway graph, a given Turing machine is like a vibration of some kind, is it not? Yes, if if by a given if if by that you mean a given classical deterministic Turing machine, so it, yes. it's part with an input. Yes, it, it's it, that that corresponds to a particular fiber. I think. Yes, I think so. Right, but I think that the the class of all possible input to output transformations is like some kind of vibration in this Rulio multiway graph. I think that's right. And, and so then, so that means those are the possible Turing machines, and then, see, it's going to, it's going to be your principle, whatever the heck it is, your, your, what's that thing called? The, why is it called the principle of inertia anyway? Is it because of something to do with inertia tensors? Uh, I think, I think it might be, yeah. Actually, I'll, I'll, I, that's a good question. I don't, I don't really know the history of that. Um... The, I mean, because, because eigenvalues would be, that would be something that would come up as the eigenvalues of the inertia tensor. Um, right. Uh, it seems to just be because, you know, because it's about um, aspects of the coefficient matrix that are invariant, those are called sort of inertial, those are, you know, inertial indices because they don't change. But hmm. okay, uh, but anyway, so, so look, in this Rulial multiway, in this, in this Rulial limit, we have what on earth is the distance between, because what we really want to know is some kind of distance between fibers. It is a complicated thing. It also relates to another question. What is the analog of inertial frames in real multiway in real space? Right, right. And inertial frames, one would think would be evolution according to a particular Turing machine rule. But then the question of what the, what a boost looks like in real space is the question of what a, you know, that requires some metric on the space of Turing machines. Right. Um, sorry, just going with your first question about the distance between fibers. I mean, that's already quite interesting, right? Because, I mean, that's that's essentially, you know, that's a sort of homotopy distance between paths. Yes. And that's interesting for a bunch of reasons. But one of them is that that's not, that's, that's I mean, okay. Of the various methods that have been proposed for measuring curvature in graphs, that doesn't seem like a totally stupid one to me. The, the, the idea that, that, yeah, effectively you define a pair of paths. I look at, I don't know whether it's the average or the total, whatever, uh, you know, distance between corresponding points on those paths. And I use that as some quantification of the, of the local curvature of the graph. Right. In other words, what does parallel mean? When you say parallel, what does it actually mean? Because, right. you know, if, if it's flat space, parallel means it's always the same distance apart between the two, two paths. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, also, right. I mean, I wonder whether that's been looked at. I mean, we, we looked months ago, we looked at this kind of webbing between pairs of JD6, although we mostly looked at it between orthogonal JD6 rather than between parallel JD6. Right, right. I mean, this is this homotopy construction, you know, somewhat coincidentally, is the same effectively as the inner products construction that I first proposed uh, sort of last year. Right, because you're, what, what, you're, what you're doing there is you're just you know, you're taking a pair of arbitrary geodesics, except here, unlike in the homotopy case, you only want them to be connected at one end, whereas in the homotopy case, you want them to be connected at both ends. And then you're, and then you're doing this webbing construction and you're, you're asking about shortest paths between, you know, between corresponding points. Right, right. I mean, and, and if we had a metric in Rulial space, then it would tell us, it should tell us a distance between Turing machines a meaningful distance between Turing machines. In a sense, it is the behavioral distance between Turing machines. When we're talking about distance between fibers, it's the behavioral distance because we're looking at the complete histories of what these Turing machines do and asking what is the, you know, what's the distance between those things. It is a frustrating thing. We don't have a good space of programs. We don't have a good way to think about that. Um, and I, I agree that this, what this is telling us, this sort of fiber-based distance in real space is, is something that is not just saying, look at the characters in the program and see what we have to, I mean, in other words, in other words, imagine you're doing genetic programming and you're trying to make moves between programs. The naive thing to do is look at the actual, you know, look at the genome of the program, so to speak, ignore the phenotype. This is saying, 
we're not ignoring the phenotype. The phenotype, we're looking at the a fiber is the complete life of the organism, so to speak, in some sense. Which, by right. the way, is another interesting question, because as we think about sort of the mathematicization of, of, of natural selection and biological evolution, that's not a completely ridiculous thing to think about. Hmm. See, I mean, the problem with a lot of these fields is it's not clear what, you know, it's not clear what the right question is. Like in the case of, of um, I mean, I think this distance between rules thing, distance between Turing machines, that's an interesting question because it, the interinterpretability of different Turing machines is kind of a story of, of um, you know, how far apart are these two, let's say, how far apart are these two machine codes? How far apart are, is the, is this, you know, are these two aliens, so to speak, and they're, you know, uh, and, and, you know uh, what, what is their ability to translate from one to the other? Uh, anyway, uh, okay, well, interesting stuff. We, we've been going for a while here. And I, this I, was, been... I was gonna mention, just as a, as a minor point, it, it, to, to enable better discussion about this, particularly with people from sort of category theory angles and things, we need to come up with a new prefix. Because you know, right now we, we, we have the co prefix, right, which tells you that you're basically reversing arrows, right? You know I mean, so if, if we take cohomology, if we take homology theory and we reverse all the arrows in the diagrams, we get cohomology theory. What we're discussing here is taking arrows and then kind of rotating them ninety degrees or something, right? Because you're you're, you're rather than talking about distances along arrows, you're talking about distance. You're talking about parallel distances between arrows, and we need to have a. I think we need to have a prefix like co that tells us that we're dealing with the parallel case rather than the Well, right, just to avoid this ridiculous monoidal thing, which is a horrible <laughs> name. I mean, this is the fiber fo, the, you know, FIFO. That's, that's too weird. First that's in, first cool. out. Um, the, the, it's a fiber foliation duality. Right, exactly, exactly. We, which, by the way, I mean, I think, I think, we, I think we speculated about this in the, back in the mathematics stuff. Uh, there is, a, I, I, I think at least there is a, fairly formal way of recasting the univalence axiom as essentially an equivalence relation between vibrations and foliations. Um, but that's a... Really? Yeah, well, in, in the sense that homotopy equivalence is the, is the sideways motion and, you know, ordinary predicate logic sort of equivalence is the, is the down the path motion. And what the, uh, you know, what the univalence axiom is basically doing is giving you a rule for mapping from one to the other. And so I think in a more general context, that is the, the, the FIFO story. Wow. Um, well, the, so in other words, your, your claim is univalence is, is holography. Uh, there's, yeah, well, or at least there's more connection between those two ideas than there might initially seem, yeah. Well, I think you're saying, but, but, but we're claiming both of those ideas. It's an equivalence between the vibration direction and the foliation direction. Right, right, yes. So, but, but okay, but, but anyway, so you're saying uh, a couple of people on a live stream are suggesting Rho and Pho. Um, Rho, Pho. As pho opposed is not... to Co, as opposed to Co, it's, <laughs> right. it's the Pho. I mean, what, what is the thing that needs to be prefixed? Well, I mean, something like, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, you, we, we would need to be able to have concepts like faux homology and faux vibration and things, um, which doesn't sound totally stupid, I guess. Well, but, but what, what is the right way to explain it? So what we're saying is... Um, so, yeah, so, so you, what you're saying is that whereas you would, you know, where you, where you would normally be defining things along, uh, you know, uh, okay, so let's abstract away from categories for a moment. Let's just talk about posets, right? Where, where you would normally be talking about a concept defined along a chain, you're now talking about the same concept, but defined along an anti-chain via, uh, you know, so, but via something like this, this you know, the, the, this homotopy um, path construction. Right. So what's a thing you might define? Well, distance um, is, is the obvious one. Okay, but so that's that's the Minkowski. That's a wick rotation. Yes, right, something like that. 
but what we, you know, what, what I'm saying is we need to have the point where we can we can talk about metrics and we can talk about faux metrics or something, and, and it's kind of clear what what the relationship between those two things is. Right. Unfortunately, faux has an f a f a u x character to it. Oh, that's true. Yeah, it's a yeah. fake. Um. Uh, and those people are suggesting Fido, Fi Fi, Fu. <laughs> uh, I mean, I agree that a two letter, you know, there's only whatever, you know, there's whatever it is, it's, it's, there's only about 200 of these possible things, which are combinations of a consonant, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a consonant and a single vowel um, because it has to be. Uh, how did homo, homo, okay, homo means just same in Greek. So that's how homotopy and topos means place, right? So it's a same place thing. And um, I mean, usually the usual words are things like epi and, and apo and the usual Greek prefixes. I'm not sure what, I mean, by the way, we need another name, talking of names, we need another name, which is the name for our generalization of calculus. That's true. We can't use the same prefix for these two things because they're so utterly bizarrely different concepts. Well, so as we can tell, a terrible name. What's that? Calculus is already a terrible name. So if, if we're going, I know, be I know, I know. So I mean, there's metacalculus, there's hypercalculus, and um, you know, metacalculus will be calculus about <laughs> calculus, which isn't really what we're talking about. Hypercalculus is perhaps closer. Metacalculus seems like another way of branding functional analysis, right? It's sort of doing, applying calculus methods, but to analytic functions. Right. But I mean, what we need to define is a calculus that is not about variables, right? It's a calculus beneath variables, where we don't have a whole, you know, where we're just dealing with these hypergraphs. We're not dealing with a whole, you know, integer, you know, countable variable type thing. Yeah, right, right. It's a shame that tensor calculus is taken up as meaning something else completely. Because normally, you, you, when you talk about tensor such and such, it's a way of saying you're doing something, you know, coordinate free, variable free. Yeah, but uh, this is even more. It's even more variable free than. I mean, right. by variable free, we mean you don't even define variable. The, <laughs> right. Um, a, a typal calculus. What's that? A typal calculus. Type. T typal. T by P A L. Why? Why? Because these most abstract things, you could think of them as types going all the way. Oh, I hate types. Types are a hack. Types have been a hack for 100 and... When did Russell invent... Well, did Russell invent types? I think he did. He invented them as a hack and they've been a hack ever since, is my point of view. I mean, I, I've... Um, uh, and um, somebody's suggesting infracalculus. I qu that's not bad. It isn't bad. It isn't bad. It doesn't sound. It doesn't sound like it's. It sounds. It should be easier than calculus. But I agree. Infra calculus is actually kind of interesting. Do, do, um, we, do we want to go infra or ultra? Well, I know ultra calculus is is um, uh, ultra sounds better. Um, well, no. otherwise we can go with universal, just as we have universal algebra, universal calculus. It's not. It's not saying the right thing though, because. I mean, look, the whole thing is crazy because the word calculus means a small stone in Latin and calculus is the study of continuous variation. So how this ended up being, I mean, I think the reason it's called calculus is because its full name was infinitesimal calculus, but then people forgot the infinitesimal part. Just like, you know, when I talk about, you know, when we're doing system design and I talk about calculus of annotations to mean the way that we, you know, decide how to deal with annotations and graphs. I'm using calculus in its original sense of a, a calculational scheme. I, I, th um, I thought of calculus of fluxions. I, I thought infinitesimal was a, was a later, the, the word infinitesimal. Oh, was really? Oh, so it was, was, was it, so it was a Newton thing. I mean, what did Leibniz call it? Oh, I, yeah, that I have no idea. I, I, I was, I defer to you as the Leibniz. The, the well, Leibniz. I think I'm the Leibniz expert, yeah, but I can't remember what he called it. Um, the, uh, if he even gave it a name. I mean, that's another, that's another problem that people don't name these things. You know, I have to say, I think ultra calculus is, is the, you know, hypercalculus, ultra calculus, 
I don't know which is better, hypercalculus or ultracalculus. Right, the, the, but the, the one thing I like about infracalculus is this idea that you're kind of going below ordinary calculus, right? The, no, I agree, the, I agree. Oh, it's, it's the, uh, um, uh, somebody is suggesting monoidal calculus. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, um, I have to think about this. I, I need to put something into our, our uh, things about the first anniversary for tomorrow. So, so this is a name, this is one of those urgent names. Um, <laughs> they, uh, I think it's either, I think, is there a, a word? Oh yeah, discrete calculus is, is um, uh, uh, crucial is pointing out is a, is a deep oxymoron, discrete calculus, because it's like, which isn't quite an oxymoron. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's the foliation version of an oxymoron. Instead of it being at cross purposes, it's the antonym. Yeah, right. The, but okay, so we've got two names. We've got this below calculus or, or meta calculus or hyper calculus or ultra calculus. Um, and we've got the, uh, I mean, in some sense it's above calculus because it, it allows more variation than calculus allows. Calculus allows the variation of values of a function. This allows the variation of the structure of the, you know, of things like the dimension of the space and so on. So in that sense, insofar as the word calculus um, is, uh, um, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's been a totally abused name in, in the, in, to begin with. Um, but, but let's just come back for a second to the naming of this, of this rotated, of this notion of the, the foliation to a vibration, so to speak. Do we think that most of the time we are only going one way with that rotation? That is, we're going from the vibration direction to the foliation direction, or are we ever going to be wanting to talk the other way around as well? Because, you know, in the, in the quantum field theory case, the Wick rotation idea goes both ways, although that may be completely confusing. Right, no, I, I, think, I think there are cases in which, there, in which we, want, we want to go each way. I mean, so, so like, mapping from so in the gr context foliations are very natural and fibrations are much less so but so we want to have some way of defining that that mapping from foliation to fibration from you know horizontal to vertical yeah but we're going to go we're going to end up with faux fi and fifo no we're not <laughs> <laughs> right uh, and but then also you know in the multi-way case i think talking reasoning about paths is more natural and, and, and talking about the kind of horizontal cases less so. And so, so that's kind of the dual or the, the opposite way around. And as long as it's possible, if we formalize these, in a sense, it doesn't matter whether, I mean, the, one of the nice things about the, about the co-prefix is that it's, in, it's an involution operation, right? So co-co-homology is just homology. So as long as we set this up in such a way that, that this mapping is, is also an involution, then we're in good shape. Right. Hmm. By the way, I'm, I'm going to put in my, my bid for the, for the calculus name as Celex. What? <laughs> so so if, if cal calculus means small stone, Celex is Latin for, for silicon or flint, which is what stones are made of. And so it's, it's you know, the, the idea being it's the, it's, the, it's the constituent stuff underneath calculus. That's not the only thing. I mean, litho is the, is the well, that's at least the Greek. The, 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 what's, the, right, yeah. What's the Latin for stone? Uh, you can look this up. That's or I question. can, um, I'm embarrassed that I don't know. Oh, um, lapis, of course. I always used to mistranslate it as rabbit. What, what is it? Lap, lapis, lapis is a rabbit, right? No, 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 no. L lapis is stone, which is, I, I, which is why I should have remembered because when I was learning Latin, I always mistranslated. What is rabbit in Latin? I, I think it's I, I think it's like lapin or something. Hang on, wait. Oh, l uh, wait. Lepus. Lepus, really? Okay. Apparently. But I mean, why is? What is the word for, isn't it? I mean, lupine is of or pertaining to a wolf. I'm well aware of that one. The, right. Um, uh, okay, so, so, so la lapis, saxum, murex. I, I like the idea of having, having a, a, a word that also has a Latin root as a nod to calculus, 
but which but whose meaning indicates that we are kind of going below the ordinary level of calculus, if that makes sense. Hmm. I think it has to have the word calculus in it because it is the same, the same kind of idea. It is a calculus of a sort in the original sense of a calculus. It is just that because we lost the infinite, we lost the infinitesimal prefix for the calculus. I mean, when you see a calculus textbook, right? They, you know, anyway, we want our stuff to be taught as the last chapter in the calculus textbooks one day. So it better not have a name that's too bizarre because or otherwise it can't, can't fit there. What's that? Or the first chapter. It won't be the first chapter, I don't think. I mean, that's not obvious actually, because it's interesting, like with Mathematica, people you know, teaching calculus through that, the notion of a function is very unconfusing in Mathematica, whereas in, in pure sort of abstract calculus, the notion of a function can be quite confusing. So, okay, we'll, we'll start with last chapter. It'll take another few decades to migrate to the first chapter the, or, or centuries, depending on how it works. Um, the, uh, um, no, I think, let me think for a second. I mean, so the thing I don't like about infracalculus is that it suggests it's easier than calculus, which it really isn't. I mean, what is below hypo upsilon pi omicron is means above, right? Below um, yeah, I got to run off. We have a bunch of interesting suggestions here, plus a bunch of nice um, oh, that's fun. Cooper logistis is um, Evangelos says a, a sub logician, i.e. a computer. Um, well, but, oh, I see, hypo. Well, that's an interesting one, hypocalculus, because that, that means hyper would mean above, beyond, yep. hypo, hypocalculus would mean, you know, yeah. that, that's like hyper, whatever, in, in medicine, you know, hyperactive versus hypoactive, so to speak. Hmm. Well, this is a oh, subcalculus. It's interesting. I quite like Bob's graphiculus. That seems more like a product name. <laughs> the, and there's also RBS's Waffleus Supra. Supra calculus. All right, I got to get out. You know, I wrote this thing ages ago when we were trying. Um, okay, Michael is commenting. If I hear infra calculus, I definitely do not think about it being easier than calculus. I just think infra is like, you know, inferior calculus, so to speak, the lesser spotted calculus, so to speak. I mean, I remember years ago. Um, working with somebody who was an expert in naming things, who, who told me one of his favorite, unfavorite names was a C programming language on the grounds that you can get an A, a B, or a C in your class. And, um, uh, um, and by calling it the C programming language, you're dooming it to being mediocre. Um, anyway. Calculus plus plus. Yeah, right, right. That would be the... the um, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now just, I'm, I'm led to look for one second at my, at, um, uh, I had a, a post ages ago when we were trying to name Wolfram language, and I was trying to come up with um, possible, uh, uh, possible names, so I don't know, I have to go in a moment here, but let me just um, see. Uh, here we go. 2013, what should we call language? All right, we've got here all the prefixes someplace here, I listed them out. Um, there's a lot of goofy stuff here. Uh, here we go. Okay, Anna, Alto, Dia, Epi, Exa. Yeah, I did think about Anna Calculus. 
I thought that sounded kind of nice. I'm not quite sure whether it means the right thing. Um, hollow calculus would be very confusing. Neo calculus. Hey, neo calculus is not so terrible. That, that sounds like a sort of spiritualism movement or something. I don't know. It's okay. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a cool name. It is a cool name. The, uh, I actually kind of like that one. Um, Uber calculus, ultra calculus, super calculus, etc. Yeah, these were all these were all above names. Are I we need doing to look up. Physics? What's that? Are we, can we are we rebranding the project as Neo Physics? That's an interesting one. Interesting. Well, that's a whole nother category. Um, yeah, okay, so Hans suggests, if calculus is a pebble, what is sand in Latin? Right, I mean, that, that was kind of my thinking behind sea. What, 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 what is sand in Latin? Um, Let's see. Am I going to have to pull my um, That's crazy. It's a word I've never heard of. Heroni. Do I believe that? I'm not sure I believe that. Arena is claimed to be related to a desert. No. Ugh, seems unconvincing. All right, he's gonna, that now, arena is the Latin word for sand. Okay, so this is now where I happen to conveniently have, let's see, let's, uh, I, I, I still think very it's primitive, bad. right? Because, because this is an actual big it's Latin dictionary. Stabilo, saxum, and, uh, and uh, silex are the most idiomatic translations that I'm aware of. What is, how's spell silex spelled? S-I-L-E-X. Oh, si okay. Silex. Let's see what the what the trusty Latin dictionary, which I don't believe is available online, says. I, I think it can mean flint, sand, or yeah, something of that kind. Small rocks that you'd find on the beach. Poetic and late Latin, also Virgil, blah 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 blah. Any hard stone found in fields, a pebble stone, a flint, a flint stone. It's not sand as such. It means frequently joined with lapis. Silicai. Okay, so we've also got silic. Oh, I see. Silex. Oh, yeah. We're being stupid here. Silex in its genitive is silicis. Yeah, from silic, so you, from which you get silicon. Right. Right. So which is why the I root... think it's the, most, it's the most idiomatic translation of sand, which is, which is silicon. Right, and sil silicum would be the the um, uh, you know the accusative or something of right, this. But like I was saying, if you, if you want just the notion of grit or something, then there's sabulo or saxum, I think. Um... Right. I'm afraid we're not. I, I I think the confusion of silicon calculus is, um, uh, you know. Look, I think. We, we do need this name, this, this name, we need it. And we need also, and also if we really had our act together, we'd write a, a, little, a little brief textbook like thing that explains how all the concepts of calculus actually work in this, in, in this setting. Because we do understand now how many of these things work. It will be good to get kind of all of them nailed down. I mean, I, I oh boy, okay. More, more thought here. Um, it's uh, um, hmm. yeah, quantum calculus, right? That's a, that was a suggestion there. Unfortunately, the, that's not really what we're going for because this is really very much, it's more like a graph calculus. But I mean, interestingly, hypercalculus 
sort of rhymes in some sense with hypergraph. Yeah. In some sense of, of prefix rhyming. Um, and it is, it's a calculus that is built. It's a calculus like thing, which is ultimately built on things like hypergraphs. I don't know. Yeah. I'm also not, yeah, okay. Is the subject we want to build calculus or is it sort of analysis, right? I mean, ca calculus implies that you only care about the methods, right? Whereas analysis right, so you're going to say, instead of, uh, instead of Poincaré's you know, analysis in situ, you're going to say analysis in silico. It's not a bad idea. It's crazy <laughs> because in silico is like what, what people who do, you know, uh, um, uh, rational drug design and so on talk about yeah it's like it's like three levels of, of pun right it's it's sand and we're doing it you know on <laughs> microchips and yeah i i think it's, it's good An analysis in silico that that's a um uh but unfortunately you know the word analysis as a word for uh for the you know for the activity of of sort of what's you know the more general version of calculus is a terrible word because it means a gazillion other things Right. And um, uh, I don't know, at the time when people were starting to use that term, was it, was it Poincaré? I think it was Poincaré who probably started using it. And, it, and probably, you know, then, then we're also dealing with a you know, potential mistranslation from French and all kinds of things like this. Um, but all uh, fields of math have very bad names. I mean, what's that? Basically, all fields of math have terrible names, right? Like algebra. No, category theory is not that terrible. It sounds exotic. Uh, yeah, maybe. I think the words of category theory are rather nice. I mean, morphisms and functors and things like that. Those are nice sounding words. Um, as opposed to, I mean, an algebra is a fine, fine word. I mean, I don't know whether algebra... You except, know, that, except, again, that it has this problem that it means a zillion things, right? Like, well, it does now, but it didn't originally. Oh, sure. And has I mean, a, it has... Look, it, it's like the word sine for the sine function was a, a mis... What was it? It was a mistransliteration of a mistranslation of a word in Egyptian, I believe. Right, right, right. Yeah, so sine, cosine, algebra, algorithm, they're all uh, various partial transliterations of Arabic. Right, but I think the sine one is wrong. I think, it, right. I think somebody just got it completely wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, anyway, um, there's some fun suggestions on our live stream here. Sablo is sand in Esperanto. Boy, what we really need is, is to look up what it is in, in, um, uh, in Ithquil. That, that's some, <laughs> the, uh, um, it's some, um, okay. Uh, pathway calculus. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's more what it's, um, um, all right. I, I have a feeling that for our, I, I'm, I'm going to men make a mention of some some word, say, which we haven't yet figured out for, for the things I'm I'm describing tomorrow. Pathway. I, I was for some reason. What's that? Pathway calculus sounds like an economics concept, like a sort of critical path analysis type method. To me, right. Um. Sorry, what were you saying? Um. Uh, what was I saying? Sorry. Um. Uh, no, I think I think we probably have to wrap up because I'm I'm now about to be late for two things here, and um, uh, even though, well, this was interesting. Um, good, more more of these um, to do. Even if we didn't name, we've got two names we have to make up, and we haven't. Um, um, the problem is with these names, like. Both the name Branchial and the name Rulial, we came up with in fractions of a, of a second, so to speak. Um, and unfortunately, in my experience with naming is you either get it very quickly or it's very painful. Um, and uh, and, and uh, I, I remember us using the terms Branchial and Rulial initially as a joke, 
and then they just kind of or, or semi as a joke and then they actually became well rulio you know, was a joke yes um <laughs> rulio was a generalization of branchial right the um but uh, um Look, I think it's really hypercalculus, anacalculus, neocalculus. I think is too new age. Um, they, I don't know what. Um, not necessarily bad, but but uh, just a little bit odd. Um, the uh, hypocalculus sounds too medically problematic, so to speak. Um, the, your your uh, calculus levels are too low. What's that? Your, your calculus level problem. is too low, right? The um, and. Uh, um, I mean, I, you know, for some reason, I kind of liked anacalculus, but I, I, I'm worried that it ends up being, people don't understand that. Hypercalculus, people would understand that it is something beyond calculus in some sense. And, um, uh, you know, I think metacalculus is wrong because I think it's cal that will be calculus about calculus, as you said. Um, so I'm kind of thinking hypercalculus is going to wind up being the thing. Um, is there any existing meaning to that word? I, I just looked it up. It doesn't, um, it's not in wide usage. Um, some guy seems to be using it as a term for sort of, you know, calculus in higher dimensions, but I, that doesn't seem to be a standard usage. No. Um, the... I, I, this looks like, this looks like uh, open territory. All right. Um, let's, uh, um, so fair enough, fair enough. Well, there it is. Um, at least let's, let's give it a little tomorrow. I think it's, I think it's hyper is probably better than ultra. Right. And, and uh, I mean, the nice thing about that is it's because it's quite a simple prefix. We can even, we can go from, we can see, we can talk about hypercalculus and hyperanalysis. And I think both of those phrases are as far as I can tell, hyperanalysis has some linguistic meaning, but no mathematical meaning. That's a good word as well. Hyperanalysis is a good word. Uh, let me see. Oh, okay, there's there's someone in mathematical logic who's using it, but again, doesn't seem to be a widespread term. Um, yeah, I think I think I'd say hyperanalysis seems again pretty much open. Hmm. Okay. The um, all right, we'll give it until tomorrow, but um, uh, there's a fun one from uh, New Katha here. Infin infinite trometry. Infinite trometry. Hyco <laughs> That's a good one for Parmenides. Hypocalcemia calculus. That would mean hypocal. Calcemia, right? That's a that's a calcium deficiency, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a calculus is is um the uh, the, uh, the 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 stone without its um without its stone axial calculus. Okay, yeah, you know, that that suggests a little bit more axiomatic kind of um uh oh ancestral is talking about hypertrophy of the branchial space. <laughs> yeah, right. That that's the we can. You know, this is, you know, various kids, you know, I, I asked them what they're learning and they say they're learning things that they're never going to use in their later life. That's exactly what I said about Latin and Greek when I was learning them. I look at this. Now we can actually translate a word like hypertrophy without really needing to know beforehand what it means, although I do know that particular one. The, um, uh, I have to say my efforts in, in um, uh, one of my favorite, oh boy, Flying is saying there's lambda calculus. What about beta calculus? Oh gosh, you know alpha. lambda calculus. What's that? Alpha calculus. Yes. Oh boy. <laughs> right. I mean lambda calculus. I think we nobody. Alonzo Church invented this term lambda, and I, I did try to figure out what. You know, people have claimed that there was an iota and there was an epsilon before there was a lambda. But I couldn't find that stuff. It was claimed that Hilbert had used one of those, but I couldn't find that. Um, I don't think Russell, you would think, would have defined a, a thing like lambda, but I don't think he did. Um, and uh, um, I mean, I don't think the notation that Church had was particularly nice. 
So um, we, we've got basically curly brace calculus, right? That, that's our scoping equivalent of the lambda. I guess. I mean, we mean curly brace. I mean, it's, we, we've got now these much more beautiful arrow things that in, in version 12.3, you can just type vertical bar dash greater than, it'll turn into a nice function arrow. Okay. So arrow calculus? That, that sounds like a rebranding of category theory. Yes, it does. Never mind. Actually, Yang is, is commenting, if this new calculus will be about graphs, what will its methods be called? You can't reuse path integral because that already means something. Yes, well, uh, um, right. I don't think, well, there is a slightly bizarre thing, which is the, the thing below a variable. We may end up with a thing that is a, a notion, I mean, because we, we have things below variables. We have this notion of a variable is constructed from an equivalence class of uh, sort of links in the graph, in the hypergraph. And I, I am slightly afraid of the term hypervariable, which reminds me of immunoglobulins. You know, there are hypervariable regions. That's, that's how uh, the immune system works, um, is, uh, uh, so, um, we, I, I think we, we can't worry too much about this medical stuff or else, you know, calculus, people could always have said, oh, it sounds too much like kidney stones or something. Oh, like teeth, a, teeth, it's calculus or, on teeth, yeah. right? There, there's a, there's, um, there, there's whole, there's a whole world of, of, uh, of, I, I mean, I've, I've even been in conversations with people where, because I mix with lots of different kinds of of, of folks, I've been in conversations where somebody means by calculus, they mean, uh, you know, the, the buildup of calcified stuff. And it was very unclear from the sentences said whether they meant calculus in the sense of fluxions or calculus in the sense of calcified stuff. Um, they, uh, anyway, well, lo lots of fun here. All right, well, okay, we should wrap up for now. Uh, tomorrow, we will be doing a live stream at 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, summarizing um, things that have been happening in this past year of our project. And um, uh, Jonathan said he wants to talk for a couple of minutes, which I just don't believe from Jonathan. <laughs> um, but so uh, we'll both probably say some things and then we'll have a, a, a Q&A period um, and uh, look forward to that. All right. Well. Thanks, uh, Jonathan Xerxes. Thanks to everybody on the live stream and uh, hope to see you tomorrow.